After officially introducing a reimagined Broly into the Dragon Ball canon, what if Dragon Ball Super chose not to hit the ground running with a Maro arc, and instead focused on the developing lore at the time? What if there are direct consequences from Seventeen's wish after the Tournament of Power? This video is sponsored by Opera GX. Opera has brought back a feature that modern web browsers have forgotten about. Easily in a matter of seconds with GX, you can pick through several different themes, including anime, or even upload one of your own photos to use as the background to your web browser. There's even an option for animated themes with Opera add-ons, which will really make your browser your own. You can also choose between built-in light and dark modes, which is an absolute necessity for people with sensitive eyes like myself. Aesthetics aside, if you're in the middle of watching a series, there's a feature that lets you separate your videos from your browser to make it just a floating adjustable video frame, eliminating all the extra clutter on your screen to allow you to better study, work, or game while catching up with your favorite shows. And if you're more of a music person for your background noise, GX has an option for that too. You can log into your preferred music streaming platform directly from the sidebar. It's also worth noting that if you're lazy like me and just don't want to bother redoing all your bookmarks, cookies, and all that, Opera has a quick import feature that swaps everything for you. Finally, and in my own humble opinion, the best feature, you'll also get to see the latest Mondo Cool uploads in your GX corner by using the exclusive link pinned in the comments and in the description. GX already has amazing reviews across both PC and mobile devices. It's completely free, so give it a try today and see what you're missing. Among all the fighters our heroes had faced during their decades-long odyssey, beginning as the misadventures of a strange monkey-tailed boy, it quickly evolved into regular battles to save the Earth, universe, and more. Goku would face other aliens with otherworldly techniques, ancient beings with unbelievable power, and magical creatures who bend logic itself. Most recently, Goku and Vegeta came face to face with a formidable new Saiyan who had appeared. They struggled to beat this mighty foe who personified brute force incarnate. As such, and rather begrudgingly of the prince as to not damage his pride, they ended up uniting their power to put down the monster they were faced with, Broly. The legendary Super Saiyan himself, formerly cast off to a distant world during his childhood. Goku's pristine, pure mind led him to see the goodness within the legendary warrior's soul. He wasn't a bad guy, just misled and born into unfortunate circumstances. Our hero would even visit him on planet Vampa to deliver some much needed supplies, and much appreciated supplies given the barren climate of the uncivilized world. Broly then felt indebted towards Goku. Up until recently, his father Paragus was the only other person he ever knew. Between Chila and Limo, who first showed kindness and empathy, now another Saiyan. An inconceivable friendship was born. While everything was quiet all over the seventh universe, Android 17 travels the oceans with his family, just as he desired. However, an event from the past was about to impact the future. The unknowing warrior's selfless wish back at the Tournament of Power had an unexpected effect on the multiverse around him. The consequences of this seemingly benevolent action will shape the future on a much larger scale than previously believed. Meanwhile, on planet Sadala in Universe 6, Khalifa begs Champa to teach her some secret techniques. Though the fat cat merely kicks back, slurping on his drink, appearing to be completely uninterested in improving the combat abilities of his universe's fighters. When his focus is abruptly pulled to something else, Turning to his left, he wonders what in the world that forces he's feeling. While the Saiyan in the background remains on her one-track mind, the ground begins to rumble. They ponder if it's an earthquake, but it's a much different kind of tremor. Champa wonders what his brother is doing in this universe. Turning to her would-be mentor, Khalifa asks if this is one of the techniques he's going to teach her today. Screaming to her sister in arms, the revenge on Goku is getting close ever so slightly, a little too enthusiastically. Universe 11, top kneels before Belmont. As one could guess, the former is continuing along his path in becoming a god of destruction. When they too feel an astounding energy, but this time it's Goku. Margarita chuckles, it's almost as if you were really close by. But how could that be possible? What is happening in these universes? And in our universe, on Earth, it appears as if several tornadoes have overtaken a city. Saving a crowd of people inside a bus, Krillin does his best to control himself and maintain his duty. He tells everyone not to panic and to get out one by one. Doing so, Krillin removes his helmet to face Skyward. In his mind, 
He asks his friend, doesn't he feel his frenzied quest for power is going too far? Beerus' world, Whis also gazes into the universe. When he gets a message from someone, Shin and Old Kai, sheepishly, the Supreme Kai rubs the back of his head to first apologize for the unannounced call. But the universe itself is shaking. Moreover, he feels Son Goku's and Lord Beerus' aura is going berserk. All things considered, he would like an explanation for what's currently going on. Who at first only appears to subtly giggle at the question, before then telling his dear Shin, what's happening? It's a culmination of training of Son Goku. Closer, curious of Goku. The Saiyan screams for him to get out of here, knowing full well what's going on up in space. Blasting from the planet, Goku can only wonder why Beerus would put an entire world and species in danger. And realizes one has hitched a ride. The destroyer bellows for Goku to get ready. Back with Whis, he elaborates on how the pair left 30 minutes ago already. The Oracle Fish is amazed someone has been able to keep a fight going with Lord Beerus for so long. This Earthling really is astonishing. The Angel has a bad feeling and thinks it might be a good idea to join him. And the Oracle has a vision. He cryptically utters, We'll act upon our own ending. Universe. Consequences. Whis glances down. Might this somehow be linked to the fight happening now? On Earth, the rumbling stops at last. Boo throws his arms in the air to shout he's hungry. While the former holds his granddaughter and introduces her to his pal Boo, the pair are revealed to be a capsule corp for a gathering of some kind. Chi Chi growls, Goku better hurry up and get here already. As Fidel assures her not to worry, he shouldn't take too long. Gohan is so eager to see him. Piccolo points out it appears Goku's. Referring to him as Sun, his surname like in the original manga, training has finished. He will be returning soon. Looking up. Speaking of training. Gohan vows to get back to it himself. You never know what might happen and it might be needed. His longtime friend is glad to hear it. While his spirit is admirable, the Namekian wonders what will become of his studies. 
but he'll find a compromise between these two lives, somehow. Planet Pishin, 2,000 times Earth's gravity. On this distant world, Vegeta trains vigorously, not only enduring the planet's immense natural pull, but also sporting hand and ankle weights, though he can't stop the feeling. All of these trainings are becoming totally useless. Hitting a wall, what else can the prince do to further his goal? Will he find his own path to power, following his personal strengths like in Super? Meanwhile, a few minutes ago, Goku appears heavily damaged. He stutters to tell Beerus that without him intervening, the destroyer would have extinguished an entire civilization. But he only grins he guesses he'd just be doing his job as God of Destruction. Will Goku further his path in mastering Ultra Instinct and finally surpass Lord Beerus? Or is he only treading water in a long, fruitless endeavor? Turning to the child who grabbed onto him, he staggers to assure everything will be alright and he shouldn't worry. But falling back to his base and collapsing, it's just as Piccolo suspected. The battle is over. Closing his eyes, Beerus admits never before has a mortal offered such a fight. Even within gods, rare are those who force him to use such power. However, the Chort's Goku has reached his limits. With Goku, Beerus' words fade into nothing. The Saiyan has visions of his friends back home. Vegeta scowls, you're completely on the ropes, Kakarot! As Baba shouts for Goku to wake up. But what is this place? What is going on with our hero? He then sees... Water? Right in time! He was getting thirsty. Firing that monstrous attack at Beerus, the god transforms to reveal a new form. He hisses for Goku to be proud. He can barely remember the last time he combined these two powers. Zipping away, the deity assures whatever he does is useless. As things are now, the Saiyan is as slow as a turtle. Even Whis is surprised at how much the two are pushing it. Ultra Instinct combined with his destructive form, or possibly Ultra Ego. Beerus indeed recognizes Goku as a powerful warrior. Winding up, Beerus gets ready for the oncoming blast, cackling just when his body was getting rusty. And just as our heroes gives out, And just as the Destroyer was getting really into it, the Angel explains that form is really hard to control, even for Goku. When it dawns on the Catman, his planet was destroyed during this fight! On the sacred world of the Kais, Old Kaio catches up on some reading, while Shin wonders which kind of power Goku used to shake the entire universe. When Beerus and Whis appear, as the former snatches a servant's staff, he stomps over in the Kaioshin's direction, who in a panic addresses his counterpart. Terrified, he questions what the sudden visit's about. Shoving the staff in his face, he inquires he can fix his planet, can he? Which, technically, yes, he can. As Whis reminds that staff is precious, as he knows. As the gang arrive back at the former planet, Shin is baffled to discover only a few floating rocks remain. Is this all? The angel offers a chuckle to admit, as funny as it sounds, that is the case. But, with a furious glare, Beerus questions what's wrong. The Kaioshin better not say he's unable to do his job. But no, that's not it at all. It's just going to take him a bit longer than expected. With that settled, he informs Whis they'll now go to retrieve Goku. His atmosphere aura will expire soon. 
Though his servant quells, he not underestimate the angel's abilities, signifying Whis is the reason the Saiyan has been able to survive in deep space. A little later at the Grand Priest Palace, we're met with a spectacular view of his kingdom. It appears he has called a conference to speak to the angels. He thanks him for their presence here. The Grand Priest warns, before all, not a single word of what he has to say can leave this place. If the Omni Kings were to become aware, heavy sanctions will be issued. They already know why they're here, but they're all missing one critical bit of information. Lapis, the Earthling from Universe 7. He wished to restore the universes which disappeared during the Great Tournament. The problem is, this also restored the seven universes which were void for an eternity. One of the angels interrupts to clarify. Did he really mean to say seven other universes? Weren't there only 18 universes initially? Where did this additional realm come from? And the fact that there were originally 18 universes isn't the entire truth. While he never mentioned it to any of them, there was a 19th universe as well. It was called Universe Zero. Kusu beckons her father. Why hide it? What is the importance of it? He admits he had no choice. His numerous children begin to speculate on the reasoning. They eventually come to the idea that this additional universe must have housed a traitor or rogue angel of some kind. When a new face appears from behind to suggest that maybe it's the Grand Priest who's the traitor. The Grand Priest gets a chill knowing he should have figured this would happen today. A woman enters to declare the one they refer to as father is nothing more than a coward too afraid to face his own past actions. These accusations naturally aggravate the various angels. Mojito barks just who does she think she is to judge their father? Margarita Quelzi calm himself. They have to remain neutral no matter the situation. The woman continues to bellow they have all been left in the dark and she never abandoned them. If they will, she would like to enlighten them to this imposter's past. A few minutes earlier, on Beerus' planet, Whis asks Goku how he feels now. His fighting abilities have taken on incredible proportions. The Saiyan apologizes for this. He was so obsessed at the possibility of defeating Lord Beerus, he might have taken things too far. However, the Destroyer chuckles at the very thought, warning the young mortal against dying with his mouth so wide open. Though Goku has to laugh himself that he really isn't so young anymore. With that, Whis figures it's about time to heal the warrior, but he has a minor objection. If possible, he wants to keep the scar on his back. He only wants to remove it when he himself is able to inflict such damage on Lord Beerus, causing the god to jump up shouting to touch him if he can. And such a thing can easily be done. Healed up. Goku compliments Whis's powers are just as good as Senzu Beans. It's really useful under critical circumstances. Whis seems to take exception to this, appearing to narrow his eyes to comment how these Senzu he speaks of essentially contain angel powers, likely another mortal deity line the gods do not like crossed. When the angel notices some petals floating in the air, identifying they're from the magnolia flower, he sees Shin decided to take some liberties when recreating this planet. Something Beerus doesn't like at all. At any rate, they question Goku what he plans on doing now. And to be honest, he doesn't really know. He still has to master his own power, and he doesn't believe there's a power above Ultra Instinct. Yet, he still didn't manage to win. First with Jiren, now Beerus. Other than that, he thinks it'd be a good idea to go home to his wife and kids. Chi Chi must be worried to death. Escorting the Saiyan back to Earth. Goku mentions, by the way, Whis never told him what he plans on doing. And at the moment, he has something to check on. He has a bad feeling. But what could be causing him of all people, a literal angel, to be this worried? The truth is, he feels a new presence. A tremendous force concentrated at one point that was not there previously. Reaching out for him. Goku places his hand on Whis's shoulder, pleading to let him handle it. The angel merely utters for him to remove his hand. Standing with his convictions, Whis repeats himself with a more serious tone. Clearly at an impasse, he tells Goku it's not the Saiyan's job to handle the problems of the universe. 
but as if it would be the first time. Of course it's his job, urging him to just trust him. Relenting, his mentor finally agrees. However, he's unable to come with him right now. The Grand Priest has summoned him. If he needs him, all he has to do is press this button. Our hero thanks him. Though if he wants the Angel's opinion, his assistance is completely unreasonable. But the warrior promises not to disappoint him. After taking a quick diversion, they arrive at their destination. A swirling void in the emptiness of space. Universe Zero. Back in the present time, at the Grand Priest Palace, the mysterious intruder reiterates she never abandoned the angels, and she wants to elaborate on this imposter's past who they call their father. Simply put, he provoked mass genocide and believed himself to be on equal footing with that of the Omni Kings. The Grand Priest finally tells her that's enough. He rises from his throne. His children kneel and request he explain himself and to reveal the identity of this angel-looking woman. As many of you likely guessed, she is an angel and their mother. Moreover, what she says isn't a complete lie. This 19th universe he previously mentioned was particularly powerful. It released a monstrous strength and threatened the balance established by the Omni King. Something had to be done quickly, so he acted without the King's knowledge. These words cause the woman to let out a maniacal laugh. Quickly isn't the right word. Expanding space-time may be a brief action for himself, but those slain by his actions did not suffer a swift execution. They felt everything as time itself tore apart the bodies of innocent people by the billions. It may have only lasted a second for him, but for all those affected, it was several tens of billions of years. All the Grand Priest has to say about this, since he doesn't possess the power of Lord Zeno, he had no other alternative. And these actions all but confirmed. The mother rhetorically questions her children if they hear that. From his own mouth, their father found it wiser to cover up his barbaric act rather than to be honest with the king. But strangely, she doubles back. She quells they not blame the priest. None of this is his fault nor that of the king. But what could she possibly mean? At the same time in Universe 12, Jin stares at the sky wondering what's going on. Belmont does the same in his realm, however, he recognizes several familiar energies. As the Mother Angel continues, she places the blame on not any individual, but the system itself which was set up forcing the Grand Priest to act. When twelve figures suddenly emerge out of nowhere, one pointing out the irony of the situation, it's actually kind of funny while another, appearing much more brutish in stature, thanks Kansei for taking the pressure off all of them. Kansei likely the name of the Mother Angel. Peering around the crowd, we can make the assumption these people are destroyers and their angels. One angel on the back mentions how strange it feels to return to this place, while another simply states how familiar all these faces are. Whis tells how these are the gods and angels of the destroyed universes, remembering back to a time their existence was meant to be. This causes one to cackle out that Whis is still as sharp as attack, and only hopes he didn't miss them too much, before another voice rings out for them to behave themselves and bow down. Their faces finally come into view. First, we have Galleon and the destroyer Balkan from Universe 13. These names are a play on Balkan Vodka and Giliano, a sweet herb-based Italian liquor. From 14, the angel Zeres and god of destruction Dromel. Named for a white wine in Hydromel, a beverage derived from fermented honey similar to mead. In 15, we have the blindfolded duo of Melada and Vilspring, the latter being the one responsible for that cackling just a few moments ago. He screams he feels like he slept for hundreds of times longer than that cat Beerus. As for the wordplay, Melada is a Georgian wine, and Vilspring was inspired by Devil Spring Vodka, a very high proof spirit. Ironically, it's so strong that if not properly manufactured can cause you to lose your vision. Universe 16, surrogate home of the angel Remtal and destroyer Menyak. Snickering a sinister chuckle, Menyak takes pleasure in seeing everyone in good health and not injured. They've arrived just in time. The party hasn't even started yet. Remtal is an anagram of Torah Merlot, 
and Menyak is the same for Armagnac Brandy. And for the 17th universe, we have the god named Nisos, named for Dionysus, the Greek god of liquor. He was actually a dead ringer for a Kyoshin rather than a destroyer, the hair and the Protari earring being the giveaways, but still appears to bear a destroyer's clothing. Whatever the case, he warns Alaros to stay calm. Panning down to the angel, he shows nothing short of pure rage on his face as he hisses Weiss's name. What history could the two possibly share? Did the angel of Universe 7 also take part in his destruction? Just then, Bados instructs her brother to look a particular direction, though he assures he has already seen what she refers to. None other than Frieza! But how could this possibly be? The tyrant bids a good evening to all. He's been looking forward to meeting them, though he especially wanted to thank Whis in person. We're then introduced to an angel named Twist, which isn't only an appropriate name for the situation, but also yet another alcohol pun for a variety of drinks. With this panel, it reveals her and Frieza to be the angel and destroyer of Universe 18. Surely this couldn't be another version of Frieza native to the 18th universe, so how did he make his way all the way there? Twist beckons Whis, or possibly all angels, if they see where this excessive neutrality leads to. Our angel is primarily fixated on the Golden Warrior. He thinks he understands what he's planning to do. Back at the Tournament of Power, he knew bringing him back to life he wouldn't have just sat twiddling his thumbs for long, but to go this far. The villain spats to not underestimate his intentions. This is merely a foretaste, an appetizer of his true plans. Upon persuading that know-it-all Zuno to explain everything he needed to know, the commanders of the Frieza Force informed him to the appearance of the new universes. He has to admit it was rather surprising Zeno decided to do away with the 18th universe at all. Its god of destruction was miserable, not even remotely fit to hold his position. According to Twist, he had disagreed with his universe's behavior, obviously not having the makings of a revolutionary. Flashing back, Frieza tries to assassinate the Destroyer from behind. At first, he would miss his initial attempt. Whether purposely or to only fulfill his own sadistic personality, he wouldn't miss again. Using his other hand, he fires several holes into the god, all the while joking it appears he's more accurate with his left arm. He moved in to add insult to injury, mocking that he vomit a little more. His robes are too tight for him anyway. And finally cracking his neck, the Space Emperor dons the Destroyer's clothing for himself. He scoffs that his impotence was disconcerting, and he wonders how he managed to become a god of destruction in the first place. But he doesn't think any of this concerns Whis himself. Having listened to the entire story, Whis admits he doesn't understand the point of going this far with it. But he's right. None of this is his concern. Continuing his vile ways, Frieza questions the angel if he regrets his resurrection. He pauses, then utters his opposite is ill-informed and has no idea of where he steps. Regardless, he would like to credit Whis. All of this is thanks to his generosity to take the risk of bringing him back so willingly. But for the moment, if he wouldn't mind, would he divulge the whereabouts of Goku? The Grand Priest asks, Son Goku? What does he have to do with all of this? Prompting Whis to explain how he spotted Universe Zero just before he was summoned here, he agreed to let the Saiyan scout it out for himself, but has since lost contact with him and he hasn't used the button he gave him. For the moment, they are unable to reach him or distinguish his presence in the condensed auras that form in that realm. Maniac inquires if he's talking about the mortal who came through screaming like a donkey right into their headquarters. He needn't worry about him. They welcomed him justly. The Grand Priest now wonders why they would be keeping Goku imprisoned. The power of the deities is still far beyond that of any Saiyan. Goku is not a threat to them. Could it be that the mortal possesses vital information useful to the resurrected gods? Kansei taunts Kaishi not to look so ignorant. He knows exactly what they're planning with him. Kaishi, presumably the Grand Priest's actual name. Simultaneously, with Goku, our hero kneels in chains, prisoner of the gods. He screams for the cowards to get back here, wanting to know what they want from him. With a final glimpse of him from the apocalyptic world, all he can do is apologize to Whis. He grossly underestimated the challenge in front of him. 
After being told by Kansei he should know exactly what they plan to use the imprisoned Goku for, Kaishi, the Grand Priest, finally relents to inquire about their demands. Without skipping a beat, Maniac hisses they want the abolition of the divine hierarchy and the removal of that neutrality he's always been so obsessed with. The Destroyer emphasizes this point by throwing an errant strike in the Grand Priest's direction, causing Kusu to cry out for her father in terror, though he urges her to stay calm. That's when the various destroyers begin circling the divine leader. Voice of Scowl, it's this mentality that blocks him, fogs the truth. And it's the divine hierarchy that, during the so-called tournament of power, erase the gods, but not the angels. Bill Spring snarls, knowing this. How can he call himself a guide? When Jermel speaks up, the towering brute commands no more games. It's time to make things happen. But the Grand Minister wants to call his bluff. He taunts. Oh, and what will you do? What can you do? Kansei rests her leg on the toppled lectern. She declares a war between deities on a multiversal scale is about to begin. The revolution starts now. Every individual, mortal or not, will have to choose a side. Only one will remain. They wish to fight for a new world with a perfect balance. Without warning, the Grand Priest unleashes an attack against the revived gods and angels. Though not without taking great damage himself, he falls to his knees bleeding from the mouth. Usu approaches to tend to the situation, but he tells her not to worry. As we gaze out to see what this technique accomplished, all of the opposing gods and destroyers stand frozen in place. His daughter questions what he's done to him, and it's just that he has frozen them in time and space. But it's not over. They have to teleport them to the Zero Universe and freeze it in turn. She argues won't that be dangerous for his health. However, he scoffs at her not to be ridiculous. Whis implores Kukatel to assist him. They have to gather all the Supreme Kais with Kibito. There will be 13 in total, which should be enough. But what does this mean? Acting swiftly, the Kaioshins we know immediately arrive on the scene. Hookatail formally greets him. As Whis has already summarized the dire situation to him, he wants to know if they'll be able to help. Vito admits this won't be an easy task, but with 13 of them, they will find a way to succeed. With time of the essence, our angel snips they stop the formalities and prompts everyone to stand. As Kaishi motions for everyone to continue with their plan. Meanwhile, back on Earth, the gang continues with their get-together, completely unaware of the dramatics going on with the gods and angels. As Videl and Chi-Chi carry plates of food to the others, 18 darts up to insist they let her help with that. At the table, we see Krillin, Goten, Trunks, Pan, Mr. Satan, and Boo. The latter, most likely, the most excited to eat. Oh, something doesn't sit right with Chi-Chi. Gazing up to the sky, we all know what she must be thinking. Her daughter-in-law takes notice. Without saying a word, she quietly begins to head inside. Goten asks Fidel if his mother's doing all right, but she's not quite sure. On another note, if we look at the capsule court building, it appears a bit damaged. Was it from the fight between Goku and Beerus, or something else? Concerned, Fidel trails after her to question if she's okay. While trying to keep a stiff upper lip, Chi-Chi insists everything is fine through the unstoppable tears. Fidel reaches out for her. She insists Goku is just late. She knows how he is. Trying to laugh off the situation, this is just how he's always been with social gatherings, at least from what she's seen and heard. Chi Chi does her best to manage the smile, returning the chuckle and admitting she must be right. At the same time, Gohan stands in the mirror straightening his tie. Then rethinking his attire, he appears to lose the vest in favor of something a little less butlery. Outside, he gazes at the beautiful sky, taking in the lovely scenery. As he pulls up a chair to join the others, we see he's ditched the tie as well, though he's a bit confused why his dad hasn't arrived yet. While ruffling Goten's hair, Adele doesn't have much to say on the matter. While in the background, Trunks drives his mother crazy playing with a dog, possibly B, instead of getting ready to come to the table for dinner.
She continues her shouting as Gohan takes note of his mother's expression. She's still clearly focused on the whereabouts of her husband. But knowing nothing can be done, he figures they should just eat. And something catches their attention. Looking upward, he asks, what's that? <laughs> Meanwhile, in Universe 11, Planet Zarus. Jaren goes to wrangle up a monstrous dinosaur-looking creature. He grabs a net, or reins, caught around its teeth to pull its head up. Before sending it flying! Though there are few questions regarding this scenario. Was he trying to save the creature, or kill or subdue it? As a punch like that from Jiren is likely to be a death blow for most natural life. Either way, something above also appears to capture his attention. Universe 6, Planet Geno. One of our favorite assassins makes his way through a crowd. Some of their faces we may recognize. It's made evident rather quickly he's on the clock. Acting before anyone even knows what he's done. He calmly walks away as a group of people begin to gather around. And just like the others, something takes his attention too. But if we look at the people around him, they all look up. Does this mean it's not merely a powerful key everyone is noticing? And in the same universe over on Sadala, Khalifa continues her rigorous training as Kale stands behind her. Kappa approaches as she nears 20,000 thumb push-ups. He greets the pair. The latter stays focused on the task at hand while Kale offers a meek reply. Finishing, Khalifa finally says hello as well, though referring to him as Crawler, likely a petty insult somewhat lost in translation, as his manga is originally in French. She asks what he's doing here. And the truth is, he was just passing through. But before he can even finish, he beckons what's that above him. Apparently not sensing anything, she cockily questions what he's talking about. So he straight up points it out, telling her to look. What's that ball? Curious, but not threatened. Leafla responds pretty much with a, huh, well how do you like that? And has no idea what that thing is. She casually turns her head to tell Kale to check it out. There's a ball in the sky. Leaving her a bit confused. Though her partner assures it doesn't even matter. As it begins to speak, prompting everyone to listen to it. The entity announces itself as the Grand Priest of the Multiverse and has come to bring them the direct orders of the one they call God. Though Cabo wonders why the Grand Priest would want to talk to all of them through a giant ball, this whole thing is very strange. At any rate, he continues to address all life forms in the present world. An evil angel rebelled against him, though he was able to freeze her in time and space. It will only last for a period of two years. A war between all universes will begin once this delay is over. Every single individual will have to be ready to choose a side. Asking the obvious, Gohan questions Piccolo what that even means. The final shoe dropping. Leafless arrogance drains from her eyes while absorbing this information. Top contacts Jiren to make sure he's seeing this too. Greatest hero of Universe 11 only stoically confirms he is. Having just returned from the Tournament of Power, Krillin looks as though he just can't catch a break as he and his wife stare into the sky horrified. And finally returning, Vegeta. Removing the last of his weights, he makes sure everyone here heard that as well. His son relenting, they did. Gotan is confused. Wasn't his dad with him? But no, Vegeta figured he'd already be on Earth by now, only furthering Chi Chi's concern for her husband. With the angels and gods of the resurrected universes making their intentions clear, the Grand Prix's actions of freezing the rebels, Universe Zero, and all inside Universe Zero, have bought our heroes two years' time to not only prepare for a universal war, but to decide what side they will be fighting on. The natural choice seeming to be the side of the Grand Priest. But would the abolition of the divine hierarchy lead to greater equality or absolute chaos? Thinking. The gang only has two years. They're gonna have to get organized with everyone. Vegeta adds not only that, but everyone will have to set a goal and role for themselves for the war. And by the way, they need to find that Broly guy. He has huge potential and could be very useful. He asks Bulma if she can go get him and his friends, all green and all orange, who with an eye roll reminds him they do have names. And for his own part, Vegeta will send Gohan, Goten, and Trunks to see Whis. With any luck, he should be able to bring out the best in him. Away, Piccolo does his usual routine. As 
a mysterious stranger appears behind the Namekian. He inquires if he can help them. In space, Bulma chews out Jocko. She screeches to know what he means by I'm too busy. He needs to hurry up and get to Earth and stop being so selfish. Reluctantly, the Galactic Patrolman agrees as she hangs up the phone. Trying to save face with his comrade, he hollers. Why? It's fine! She just wants me to go find someone! I can do that for a friend, right? Though turning away, his other protests, he didn't say anything. Still ranting, Bulma swears that Jocko is such a slacker. Even when a war is about to break out, he tries to find a way to postpone what he's asked to do. Like seriously, he can do that for a friend, right? Tending to the little one, Vegeta smirks that when she's angry, even the greatest of warriors can't stop her. Heading outside to let her blow off some steam, she can still be heard as the door closes. She vows to tear his eyes out. That darned latex-coated alien! Glad to patrol her at Just wait until she finds out that latex is actually just his bare skin. While Bullet begins to fuss, Gohan calls out to the prince to joke. It sure sounds like there's a lot going on inside. Prompting Videl to approach him to tend to the crying baby, assuring Vegeta she'll take care of her. The Saiyan then calls out for Gohan. Taking a seat next to him, he wants to know his plans for the next two years. Will he train or keep to his studies? And he intends to do both, actually. Vegeta then explains if that is indeed his decision. He would like to propose something. How about training with Whis? Kakarot is currently doing his last training with him. Knowing the two of them, they'd be delighted to take him in. Clearly, our heroes are unaware of Goku's predicament. Either way, he also mentions Goten and Trunks have already told him they're in. Gohan regrets to inform he's pretty set on his idea of what to do during these two years, so he'll have to decline the invitation. By the way, for Goten and Trunks, his dad told him about a kind of hyperbolic time chamber. An idea Vegeta loves. He can accompany them himself. On Gohan's side, he inquires if he thinks Krillin, Yamcha, and Tien could be of any help. And if so, what could they do? Taking off his glasses and thinking a moment, Gohan thinks he knows just the thing. Moments later, Gohan pierces through the sky making his way to Krillin's house. Hello, he finds the entire family outside as he touches down to say hello. Setting his daughter down, Krillin asks his old friend how he's doing. While he says he's doing just fine, he gets straight down to business. He questions if he knows where Yamcha and Tien are, and as luck would have it, the both of them are inside right now, apparently coming over during Goku's intergalactic battle. Which is perfect! Gohan asks what kind of training he'll be doing over the next couple years. Though growing a nervous smile, he presses him to wait and calm down a second. That's when Gohan's phone goes off. It's Vegeta. And looking in the background, we see Beerus, Whis, and the boys. The prince tells how he's with Whis, and he's just been informed. Kakarot was in Universe Zero when the Grand Prix froze it. As a stunned silence fills the area, Vegeta tries in vain to get Gohan to answer. Back with Piccolo, the stranger from before calls out, Don't pretend, Namek! Revealing the two other Namekians from the Tournament of Power, Pinel and Seono, from our left to right. Accompanied by the Supreme Kai of Universe 6, they believe joining forces over the next two years will give them their best chance at victory. Though Piccolo, who barely gives him an ounce of his attention, asks if they think he can really help them. Kalina believes that each of them have something unique to contribute. So yes, he does. And in that case, Piccolo agrees. But before they leave, he has something to do first. Meanwhile, on Planet Vampa, the trio emerge from their cave to find a Capsule Corp ship touching down. Chilai shouts out to greet Bulma with excitement. They must have had a bit of communication between the events of Broly coming to Earth and the moment before us now. The scientist returns the greeting while smiling if it isn't her favorite aliens. Walking over, this is the first time she's got to see Broly up close, commenting she didn't think he was this tall. Taking the enthusiasm out of Chilai with a spout of territorialism. Still red in the face, she questions what Bulma wants from him anyway. And naturally, they saw the black ball in the sky, right? Limo finds this curious. He's surprised to hear she also had that strange dream. But a dream? No, it was real life. It was the Grand Priest. 
but Limo continues to argue that all three of them simply dreamt of it. Bulma then believes she's figured it out. They were all certainly sleeping when the Grand Priest made his announcement. He must have found no other way to warn billions of beings who would have been sleeping at the time. Chilai leaps forward, beckoning. So it was real? Does this mean there is an imminent war on the horizon right now? And that is the unfortunate reality they're faced with. That's when Bulma's communicator goes off. Whis, of course, who delivers the same bad news to her as he did the others. With Gohan, he states the obvious that without his dad, they all have a sure role to play, and he already knows what training would suit him best. Around the room, we have the aforementioned warriors, plus Master Roshi. Krillin states he understands, but he couldn't do anything during the Tournament of Power. Heck, he didn't even face off with the most dangerous warriors and he still struggled. So what does he want him to do in a war involving the most powerful deities? He'd like to give everyone some big Goku-like speech, but he's not that man. Roshi admits he agrees with Krillin, but is still willing to fight. However, he has been training for almost 350 years. He doesn't see how he can progress any further. Krillin admits he knows this isn't a noble way of thinking, but he belongs here with his wife and Marin. Clenching his fist, Gohan explains for years, Son Goku has been protecting them all and giving his life to the weak without hesitation. If anyone wants to stay here, do it. But his father and billions upon billions of people are waiting for them and need their help. Yamcha figures since he doesn't have a family or anything to protect, he can take part. Tien feels the same. Standing, 18 prompts Krillin to follow her. Now in the kitchen, she tells her husband to listen. She knows that all he wants is the best for her and Marin, but above all else, this is not just about their lives. And he knows, but she continues. She tells him whatever choice he makes. She will support him in any case. If he chooses to fight, she too will fight. If he chooses to stay, she will also stay. Back with Vegeta, Trunks tears up as he bids goodbye to his little sister. He knows that two years is as long as her whole life, but he promises he'll come back as soon as possible. He wants her to become a big girl, and soon she'll be a strong little princess. His father tells him that's enough. It's time to leave, doing so while simultaneously ushering Goten away. Picking up his daughter, he instructs Trunks to board the cube. Double checking to make sure they're all out of ear and eye shot. In a rare display of affection, he tells his princess not to worry, her daddy will be back. With our heroes venturing off to train in a place similar to the hyperbolic time chamber, where exactly will this take them? Is there anything the humans of Earth can offer in this war? And being so young, will Goten and Trunks be able to fully benefit from the training of Whis? A small pickup truck scuttles down the road, debris of West City scattered on the shoulders. It slows to a stop in front of Whis, Vegeta, and the boys, who are heading off to the cube which will take them to Beerus' world. Vegeta finishes slipping on his gloves as he thanks someone for taking care of Bola while they'll be gone. His father-in-law, Dr. Brief, who is more than happy to take on the task. After all, that's a sweet little granddaughter he's talking about. It's not like he has anything more exciting to do anyway. Holding his sister one final time, Trunk sheds a couple more silent tears wishing he could get to see her grow up. His father ruffles his hair knowing how he feels, whether the others know it or not. Entering the cube, he informs that Gohan and the others will be here soon and it shouldn't take him too much longer. They too will be joining him for a portion of the journey. And moments later, Gohan, Krillin, Yamcha, and Tien step forward, while 18 stays behind to tend to her daughter, and Roshi staying put because he doesn't believe he can benefit from any further training. Leading the pack, Krillin shall so give it everything they've got. It's time to enter that cube. Please checks to make sure that's everyone. And if so, where would they like to be taken to for their training? Gohan confirms this is all who's going, and he'd like to start by going to Universe 9. This throws Vegeta off guard. What could they possibly learn in that realm? 
What does he have in mind? Who figures it'd be the best place for Yamcha, Tien, and Krillin? They're gonna go to see the trio day dangers. He hasn't contacted him yet, but he's sure they'll accept. If we remember, these are the werewolf-like warriors from the preliminary fights. Though Krillin isn't very excited about the idea, arguing, Trio de Dangers? Seriously? Gohan enthusiastically retorts, Well, yeah, they'd have made mincemeat of Cell and nearly did out of Majin Buu. From a previous conversation he had with Tien regarding the Tournament of Power, the Wolf Fang Fist Fighter asks if these are the three Fox guys from before. From the stories he's heard, he's not very impressed by this dangerous trio of canines. In fact, he'll just handle them all by himself. Knowing full well what a mistake this would be, Tien advises his friend not get too far ahead of himself. Even Krillin and Gohan have to let out a lighthearted laugh at Yamcha's never-ending confidence. Who can blame him? After all, he did so well against the Cell Juniors, Android 17 and 18, Dr. Jiro, and he really gave it his all against that Cyberman. So Gohan merely tells him they'll see how that goes. Yamcha continues unwavered, promising they'll be begging him to spare him once he's done. But as patience runs out, Whis lifts the cube to get him started. Trunks bids farewell to his grandfather and sister, as when he'll next get to see him, very much will have changed for them all. Outside Planet Vampa, from inside their ship, Jocko announces that for the first time in the history of the Galactic Patrol, they will be moving from one universe to another, so everybody better hang on. She lies confused move from one universe to another. And that's right, Planet Sadala is situated in Universe 6. With an exhilarated, let's go! Jocko guns it past light speed at 100 times faster than Plaid. Boma screams she's going to kill Jocko for this. Meanwhile, at the same speed if not faster, our usual heroes enjoy a leisurely cruise from Universe 7 to Universe 9. Just as everyone begins to grow a bit bored, Whis announces they have arrived. Planet Calamon. They've made it to their first destination. Krillin jokes that the Angel makes an excellent taxi service, but he only questions. Hmm? Attack what? In the background, we get a glimpse of the world they will soon be arriving on. It appears to be swirling with a strange mist of some kind. Gohan points this out to the others. The planet seems to be made of cotton or something. Their guide informs that Planet Calamon is indeed known for having a thick layer of clouds surrounding it. Curious that it's actually known for this, Krillin asks just how thick this layer of clouds is. And more or less, it's about 3,000 kilometers thick, or 1,860 miles, which is half the radius of the planet at its center. But that much? And they have to go straight through it? With a flick of the wrist, Whis is easily able to open a hole through the fog, causing Gohan to smirk that it seems like that won't be a problem. Although, it is a bit strange that he thought that would be a problem. They did just travel through complete universes, and he really thought a little cloud was going to stop him now. On the surface, the light from space pierces through the barrier like overcast, creating an almost biblical-esque scene. Krillin peers over the edge of the cube to gaze into the abyss below. No time to check it out now, it's go time! He signals for Gohan, Yamcha, and Tien to follow him. But Gohan objects. He informs his allies he'll be getting off at the next stop. Yamcha sighs. Ah, so you decided to go after all. Which Gohan thinks will be better for him. But where could he plan on going? With the boys to train with Whis? At any rate, Tien wishes him luck. The Saiyan then questions if Whis heard what he said. Who confirms? Moments later. Goten and Trunks wonder why Vegeta decided to get off here of all places. Universe 6, Planet Sadala. On the ground itself this time, a group of Saiyans approach baffled at the technology before them. They've never seen a ship like this before. Vegeta exits to get his first look at his alternative home planet, the fate that could have befallen his own people. A warrior with a mechanical arm recognizes the alien as a Saiyan, excited to see a familiar sight. Though Vegeta doesn't return his sentiment, thwacking the native, he barks. A Saiyan! I'm your prince, you moron! Making a grave mistake, the other surrounding Saiyans take an offensive stance. One bellows if he's looking for a fight, he's in for a treat. But the visitor only mocks that a one-armed man, a one-eyed man, and an army of wimps who wouldn't even be worth a power level of 1,000. Is he really going to stoop to this? 
finally, at their stop. Trunks looks out to the world before him shouting, Look, Goten! It's Beerus' planet! Though the son of Goku is a bit taken aback. It's a lot smaller than he expected. But Trunks argues, who cares? How cool would it be to own your own planet? The Destroyer takes note of their arrival. Jumping up, he angrily questions Whis, what the heck is this? Clearly not expecting any visitors. With a giggle, he implores Lord Beerus to please be indulgent and welcome their new visitors. But furiously shaking his head, he doesn't care. This isn't some kind of Club Med for Saiyans. They need to go home. He doesn't want any kids around. Club Med being a French travel and tourism company, which I totally 1000% knew before looking up. But these remarks reverberate through Goten. A Club Med? Is he serious? His dad might be dead by now, and he's just worried about having an entire planet all to himself? The god warns the mortal to watch his tone. His father is the least of their worries in a war of this magnitude. And anyway, the hothead Goku is. He would have died one way or another when the battle actually starts. This insult causes Goten to launch towards Beerus, ready to defend his dad's honor without a second thought. But Trunks wisely tries to jump between him in an effort to stop his friend. He asks Goten if he's crazy. But the boy isn't ready to listen to any semblance of reason, telling Trunks to move out of the way. Knowing what's at stake, and the likely outcome of this altercation, Vegeta's son isn't having this nonsense and tries everything he can to prevent Goten from retaliating. He only again tells him to please move. Stop falling! Throwing Goten through a small satellite, the Saiyan grunts to Beerus it's not over. As the destroyer grabs his face, beginning to utter the word, Hakai. He stops himself, perhaps coming to his senses, or perhaps teaching him a lesson. Flicking the child on the forehead, he's knocked out cold. Beerus then calmly turns to Whis to insist that he is adamant that there will be no guests on his planet, so they must go practice their training elsewhere. Back with their favorite Earthlings, the gang tries in vain to communicate with the planet's natives. Tien attempts to get the attention of one more, but no one is answering him. Krillin deduces that the locals simply don't speak their language, which is admittedly strange. Bergamo, Lavender, and Basil understood him just fine. Finding themselves lost in the crowd, the situation may take a bit longer to resolve than our heroes hoped. But luckily, just who they are looking for happened around the corner. Basil points out to his brothers that it's the Universe 7 warriors over there. But they think it's possible that they're the ones who made the hole in the sky that the kids told him about. And with Vegeta's little skirmish ending about as one would figure, a voice shouts from behind a hill demanding to know who piled up her buddies. Revealing Khalifla, who's completely baffled in seeing Vegeta and questions what the heck is he doing here? How could Vegeta possibly benefit from traveling here of all places? Does he plan on training with Kefla, the fusion of Kale and Khalifla? And where has Gohan decided to take his own training? Blasting through dimensions to Universe 6, Jaco announces their arrival, only hoping the gang isn't all too shaken up by the rocky ride. And inside, save one of them, the passengers have been scattered throughout the cabin. In a huff, Bulma has to jab, hardly you idiot, in response to his previous question. But at any rate, the space band gleams with excitement that this ship's technology is a complete success. The Galactic Patrol have ventured from one universe to another for the first time in their history. Now, on to Planet Sidala. Earlier, in Universe 11, Margarita, Angel to Belmont, explains that the latter will not lose his destructive powers. However, he's been a god of destruction for 3,002.185 years, and the powers attributed to destructive deities only last as long as their reign. These comments get Top's attention. Belmont himself acknowledges this unfortunate truth, while adding, Will I die? Who knows? But he's already lived a very long time, even for his species. He hasn't told them enough, but Dispo, Jiren, and of course Top here are all great warriors who he respects. Taking in a breath, and with determination in his eyes, Top announces he's ready. Margarita taps her staff to begin a sort of ceremony. This causes two giants to appear. Whether biological or monuments, the pair emit an intense energy and bear an appearance only fitting to their intimidating stature.
as a radiant key envelops Top and Belmont. We're left to wonder what exactly this is all for, though we can likely make an assumption with confidence. As the ceremony goes on, a presence makes itself known to Margarita, Jiren, and Dispo. Streaking down from the sky, something lands not too far from the warriors on the alien planet. Shooting each other a quick glance, Dispo tells he's going to check it out, as Jiren stays as nonverbal as ever. Skidding to a quick stop. He's baffled who he's looking at. Why would he be here? But back at the ceremony, a tragedy has taken place. Seeming to transfer his throne to top as foreshadowed in the Tournament of Power. Belmont has rendered nothing more than a withered husk. Retaining her emotional neutrality towards non-angels, Margarita merely turns to Top to ask how he feels. And with his new power coming to a settle, he states he's feeling good. Before realizing what's happened, he screams out as his mentor falls to his knees. The former student does the same, though slamming his fists into the ground with anguish. He likely would have refused all of this had he known this would be the outcome. Entering Dispo and their unexpected visitor. As many are already aware, Gohan. The top shoots him a powerful glare, almost directing his fury towards him. And since time is a valuable commodity, especially given recent events, he admits he's not sure he knows everything that's going on here. But time is running out. He thinks they have a lot to offer him. Back on Sadala, after seeing him beat down a bunch of her cronies, Khalifa demands to know what the heck Vegeta's doing here. In tow, Kaba and Kale, the former asks what she's talking about. With a fierce scowl, she spouts that Kaba's idol just showed up out of nowhere and smashed up a bunch of their people. But his idol? What's she going on about? Vegeta at last addresses all her hollering. Almost as if he was speaking to a child, and in some respect there may be more truth to that than meets the eye. He tells her to be kind. More importantly, stop being so childish and bring him to their king. He has no time to lose. Though we all know about how well trying to put Khalifa in her place works. This tears her into a rage causing her to scream what's wrong with him? He just beat up her buddies and now he's trying to give her orders? Kappa does his best to hold her back, but there's no telling how much longer he can keep his grip. Taken aback by her behavior, the prince can only comment to himself that there's definitely something off about that girl, as he compares her mannerisms to that of a rabid dog. She continues her attempts to wriggle free, swearing to Kaba that she's going to gut him. The young Saiyan restraining her assures Vegeta not to worry, believing she won't be able to break loose. Even Kale appears a bit surprised by her actions. Turning to Kale, Vegeta decides that while these other two are acting out, he and she take him to the king instead. But even she herself appears a bit uneasy about the situation. She doesn't immediately know how to react. With the others, Khalifa finally stops jerking around and promises Kaba she'll calm down. He gives her his attention, making sure she's for real. She doubles down and assures she won't be any trouble. But Vegeta knows better. He warns his Saiyan brother and not to let her go. And it's soon made clear why. She rushes him. Vegeta decides to end things immediately by delivering a staggering Super Saiyan kick, though not to the complete approval to all nearby. As her body ricochets off the loose ground, Kaba shouts out to see if she's alright. The prince turns the other direction before barking to know what the others are waiting for, warning he better not have to repeat himself. Picking up their ally, Kaba and Kale don't appear impressed with their Universe 7 counterpart. Meanwhile, on Planet Pillar in the same universe, it appears on a pretty creepy planet, possibly the home planet of Tim Burton. As its name suggests, two giant caterpillar-like bugs are seen doing bug stuff in the background, as another insect does its best to hide from the assassin. Seeming to give him the slip, Frost pours with sweat not only out of the stress regarding the situation, but also because this planet is incredibly hot, so much so he can barely breathe. With that motion, the Frost Demon knows he must be done for. He's about to use one of his assassination techniques. 
which only somewhat turns out to be the case. Using his time skip, he gets at the villain's throat demanding some information, asking if the demon has any other brilliant ideas for tailing a man who was born to hunt. He wants to know who hired Frost to follow him, meaning it's actually the other way around. He hasn't been hired to terminate Frost. Pleading with the hitman to calm down, he assures nobody hired him. He works only for himself. In fact, what he wants is revenge. Making their way to the King of Sidala, Kaba tells his mentor they've arrived. But Vegeta doesn't see anything resembling a palace or alike. The boy instructs him to look down. And sure enough, one of the most illustrious constructions presents itself to the prince. Several stories circle one another as each lair showcases its own unique and impressive design. And looking above, this ancient appearance clashes with the futuristic technology the Saiyans here possess, not unlike the ones from our universe. This is the palace of King Sidala. He takes it all in, almost taking pride in the formation before him, thinking what could have been for his own people. Kappa shouts out to someone named Sprouts who's hovering in a ship. He asks if he can take them to the king. In the ship, he happily greets Kappa. And fulfilling the request, everyone hops aboard his vessel. Khalifa's still out cold in the background. Doing his best to ease the awkward tension, he mentions that he's never seen Vegeta around here before. So where does he come from? The prince responds that that makes sense given he's from another universe. He's never been here before. Pausing. The chauffeur begins to laugh heartily, saying that's a good one. He almost had him there for a second. But given the events Vegeta's been through, he doesn't really see what's so funny about this. Catching eye of his gaze. Sprouts thinks he may have overreacted a tad. <laughs> Snapping herself awake with her own snot bubble. Khalifa again begins to scream after Vegeta. The crazy idiot thinks he can just kidnap her? He's never gonna get away with this. As Kaba does his best to hold her back, Vegeta shouts in vain for his protege to restrain her, but that's what he's trying to do. As this continues on for a moment, luckily they're only seconds away from landing within the palace, leading the prince to leave quite the first impression on those in power here. Making their descent to the lowest level, a robot guard beckons if it should warn the king. Though the man nearby instructs there's no need to bother him, only wishing he had a coin for every time a jester desecrated this palace. However, it wouldn't be long before word of Vegeta's arrival would make its way through the palace. A messenger runs up to Lord Sadala. He tells of a strange individual who's come from another universe to request an audience. Without any resistance, the king agrees to grant it. Causing the strange, turn up, panda, to stutter. G good He's waiting for you in the main hall. And if that's the case, the king figures it would be best to simply go to him. Though towering over his visitor, the king approaches to respectfully greet Vegeta. He introduces himself as King Sidala before inquiring of his guest's name, who in turn responds with simply his name alone. As all of our heroes make their way to their first training destinations, how will they work together to improve? And will the King of Sadala be able to see eye to eye with a Saiyan from another universe? Staring down at the prince, the king tells the young traveler that he heard he comes from literally another universe. Even for himself, that's quite the curiosity. So what's his story? What brings him to this place? But Vegeta grunts he has no time to lose with his stories. He's come here for. Though Sadala interrupts him, listening to or telling a story is never a waste of time. Is it? He gestures for him to please explain everything to him. So in that case, Vegeta implores the royal to explain this palace of his. He's never seen a structure built in such depth. Who responds there is indeed a reason for that. His people have not always known peace. While he doesn't know about the Saiyans where Vegeta comes from, but here the Saiyans ruled through submission and violence, survival of the fittest, nothing mattered but strength. He himself was once an illustrious warrior, driven by his own thirst for battle and power. Here, they were just a wild race of beings, their only essence being battles. They were completely out of their minds. There were ancestral stories from this planet which referred to them once bearing tales, not unlike those of a monkey. But it seems that by the simple fact they did not use the transformative power they instilled, they would be lost to time. 
Eventually, the people would become divided. So King said all of this error provided, once again, his legitimacy by bringing the whole world together. Even non-fully blooded Saiyans would join them in an interspecies alliance. Because of this interbreeding, they were able to stand up to the most powerful of opponents. In the beginning, he himself was a simple army general adhering to the king's ideals and merely supporting him in his decisions. But through unparalleled loyalty, he was able to rise through the ranks and would be recognized as the right-hand man of their king. The years passed him from battlefield to battlefield. He saw his brothers in arms killed one after another, while his loyalty to the king only grew stronger. He was used to seeing blood, presenting the scar on his face as his witness. But this was... It was one too many. A fiend came about calling himself Gurkin the Bloody. He was a man who hated the king more than the demons themselves, more than his own demons. He was always the eternal runner-up, always falling short as the king had beaten him time and time again. But sparing his life each time only crushed and maddened Gurkin more. The release of death was an infinitely better alternative in his eyes. He couldn't bear it. And lucky for him, the current Sidala felt the same. Night and day, the present King Sidala would hunt him, driven by his own hatred, but to his amazement. The relief he so coveted by killing Gherkin was ultimately an illusion. The shoving his fist into his stomach didn't fill the void he felt. When removing it, he saw nothing but the emptiness of an endless tunnel. This shape, which has been engraved into his memory, gave its shape to the palace which they currently reside, Sidala Palace. Since the previous King Sadala hadn't sired any offspring, and because of his own hierarchical position, his people voted unanimously for he himself to succeed him. Even today, he can't look himself in the mirror without thinking of his fallen brothers. When he came to power, he vowed to perpetrate the ideals of their former king, to put an end to all these childish wars and reunite their camps. The braid he wears, he makes it every morning to remember that oath and stick to it. A Saiyan who fails to stand by their convictions is a usurper. He then tells how he explained all of this because he thinks he knows why Vegeta came here, but his ambitions will be without the Saiyans of Planet Sadala, bidding him a goodbye. But just as his farewell leaves his lips, Vegeta scoffs that he's starting to understand. Narrowing his eyes and pointing directly in front of him, he chides King Sadala is afraid of death. Baffled by his visitor's words, he stutters while asking how dare he show such disrespect. At first, our prince merely smirks and stares him down. That's when a few particular memories surface in Vegeta's head. One where he's telling someone that without Frieza around, he'd be able to beat him up, given his lack of a tail and old armor, likely Kui on Namek. Then the other, after he lets Cell reach his perfect form, only to fall miserably to the biological android. Then surprising all, he actually offers a gesture of humility and drops to a knee. Even Khalifa's dumbfounded by this. He utters, King Sadala, father of Saiyans, I implore you, whatever we do, thousands will die. It's up to us to act so it's not our own. A king who doesn't keep his promises is a usurper. Later, now on planet Nibur. Frost seems to be chasing him planet to planet, begging to help him fulfill his revenge. As this has clearly been going on for a while, we join them mid... conversation? If it could so be called. He begs him to at least teach him something, just one assassination trick. But all of his requests are met with a simple no. Frost then asks how he's going to make him suffer if he doesn't help him. But Hit tells him to do it himself and let him do his job. When the demon thinks he's got it. The technique he wants to learn is the one hits saving, just in case he ever has to make him suffer, right? Which is also met with a simple no. The frost demon then comes to a stop. Folding his arms, he scoffs, he sees now. It's a shame, he had thought they were friends. Hit might need some, by the way. Friends, that is. He's alone all the time. It's depressing. Still not giving an inch, the assassin shrugs this off uttering, if you say so. Frost goes on. He claims the two of them aren't so different. He himself knows how it feels to be forced into a mold, which is why his species won't allow itself to be outdone under any circumstance. He insists he's only telling Hit all of this because it almost sounds like he doesn't like his job, even his life perhaps.
Freezing Frost. The demon stands dumbfounded. Looks like it decided to use one of his assassination techniques on the frigid fiend after all. But of course, doesn't actually end him. He's just finished with the conversation as he once again responds. If you say so. A bit further away. She like gets a bit snuggly with her giant death puppy as she and Limo try to sleep the trip away. Bulma inquires of the patrolman how much longer this trip will be now that they're in Universe 6. And as he mouths down on some space snacks, he grumbles, two more days. This causes the scientist to let out a chuckle. Jocko is really funny when he wants to be, but how much longer will it really take? However, he wasn't joking. It's going to be two days. But he didn't tell her any of this. She hopes you remember to bring supplies. But still chewing, he just finished his super chocolate bar. With it alone, he can easily last the next four or five days. Jolting alive, Sheila also gets in on the chiding of the spaceman, prompting him to rebook. You're not going to bother me too, are you? Well, fortunately for them, Broly has him covered. If they want, he brought along six legs of some weird spider. They can all have some as he ate well before leaving. And if they're thirsty, they're plenty juicy as well. Given the air in the room, Bulma's just now discovering it's going to be a long journey. Back with Vegeta, one of the robot guards asks if it and the other should act, given their visitor's transgressions. The king himself not looking too happy. He retorts that if someone has to act, it will not be them. He urges Vegeta to continue. He interests them. The prince states the king heard the same thing they all have, so whether he likes it or not, war will take place, referring to the Grand Priest's message to the multiverse. But King Sadala should know that this is not just a civil war between Saiyans. This is his question. What will he do when the enemy enters his land? Welcome them with a white flag? As passive as he wants to be, if he is really one of those whose king he claims to be, his instinct will never allow him to be passive in this. Vegeta can't guarantee that nobody will die, but he swears to make each and every one of them his own people, worthy of their name. He admits that he might not work miracles, but he'll make sure that all of them can look after their own. Lends him back to Khalifla. He tells all within earshot that there's a lot of hidden potential among them. He's sure about that. Giving everyone a taste of what he's capable of, Sadala commands his guards to gather the whole of Sadala's special forces. He has an announcement for them. Vegeta smiles. He assures the king he won't regret this. Walking away, he himself smiles. I do not live with regret, Saiyan. With the entire Saiyan army gathered, King Sadala announces this is a call to all special forces. Gaining the trust and alliance of his Universe 6 counterparts, it seems Vegeta's plan is to not only train himself, but the entirety of the Saiyan race. How will he be able to manage so many warriors? And what will our other heroes learn in their own adventures? With his forces gathered, King Sadala announces for all of his warriors to listen well. Himself and their ancestors have fought to make peace speak for itself. But those days are unfortunately over. Everyone here was shocked by the announcement made by the Grand Priest. And now they must prove they know how to defend themselves against these fomenters of revolt. They, as Saiyans, are a people who live in a world of facts, not in a dreamlike conception of the world which surrounds them. So he ushers everyone to raise their fists and please welcome the heir to the neighboring universe. Let them both fight hand in hand. They will fight for their own. Glory to the Saiyan people. Two days would come and go for our inter-universal travelers. Jocko happily tells everyone they've finally arrived. Opening the hatch and setting foot on Sadala. 
The first Universe to Universe expedition of the Galactic Patrol is complete. Gazing outward with pride, the spaceman spouts he doesn't look too bad here. A nice change for many of their rotten planets. But as we glance around, nobody else seems to share his positive attitude. Roma quips to remind her to never try Broly's food again, referring to the giant spider-like creature he brought aboard, which was their only source of sustenance for the last 48 hours. Ignoring his passengers' groans of anguish, Jocko reaches into a pouch to continue what they've come here for. Retrieving a device, now they need to find Vegeta. He lets loose a little robot which takes to the sky, displaying technology that the modern NSA will likely make public one day soon. It's able to use facial recognition to identify everyone nearby. He figures while their technology does all the work, maybe in the meantime they'd like to get something to eat. But they all, minus Broly, are still struggling at the thought of food. The mere idea giving them flashbacks of hairy, bloody spider shawarma. Though Broly's just excited to see if they have some Udani legs, which are the tick or spider-like creatures of Planet Vampa. With his laser-like focus, Jocko spots a stand labeled kebab. He thinks that sounds cool. Confidently approaching the cook, he questions if he has enough food for five people, which he does. Shooting his customer a glare, he asks what he can get for him. And since none of them are exactly familiar with the local cuisine, Chila and Limo keep it simple by ordering the dish of the day. Though Bulma requests the Versagion salad, whatever that is. And Jocko wants the chef's specialty, this kebab thing. Turning to Broly, the cook then inquires what he wants since he's remained silent this entire time. But the giant's confused. Why does this man only serve three dishes? Chilai told him that restaurants have lots of choices. And if we look closer, we see Broly refers to the three pictures of food within the menu. In an annoyed tone, the chef questions the others if he can't read or can't count, leaving them even more lost. The legendary Saiyan asks if this means this isn't a restaurant at all. Chilai lets out a sigh, promising she tries to teach him these things. Sooner or later, the robot would spot Vegeta and the others on the ground below. Audio contact in progress. The machine contacts Jocko to let him know Vegeta's been found. Who, checking his device, looks to confirm. But being it's the Vegeta we know. Hello, Ro. Destroying the defenseless robot. For a moment, the patrolman sits dumbfounded before slamming his receiver and over and over on the table once he puts two and two together. The cost of that robot's going to come out of his salary. Back with the prince. Kabar argues, what if that was the king's? While Khalifa inquires what that thing even was. Two concerns that Vegeta simply grunts at. Freaking out, Jocko screams he's already bought a round of food and drinks for everyone while Bulma over here's just loaded. He's gonna end up broke. Scientists taking exception to this little hissy fit. She hollers at him to go and do the drone's work himself. Obviously, if he has money for fancy devices, he's not that broke. Taking off, he begins to become bothered by the fact that it seems like he's doing all the work around here. It's really starting to get boring. Flying over the central metropolis of Sadala. This feels more like a chore than anything else. A few hours ago, at Gohan's house, It seems that before he left to see the Pride Troopers, Piccolo wanted to bid him goodbye. He shakes his hand and tells him to train hard. Who intends to? And speaking of which, he motions to Videl. He'd like to take Pan to meditate, or maybe even train with him. Though she hopes he's only kidding. And he tells her that the truth is he actually did the same for Gohan, back when he was only four years old. He was the first serious mentor the child ever had. But she shouts, those days are over and he can forget it, offering a sarcastic thanks and goodbye. <laughs> While dejected, Piccolo ultimately respects her decision. Maybe next time she'll come around. And inside, it looks like Gohan's more blown away than anybody by his wife's fierce reaction, possibly getting flashbacks of his own mother. Walking off and appearing rather proud of herself, 
She tells Gohan to go and get ready. They're going to be joining Bulma and Vegeta soon. The youngster can't help but ask what's wrong with her mom, and where did Piccolo have to go off to? <laughs> Unfortunately, Videl only calls that it's time for her to take her nap now. Gohan eventually lets out a reluctant chuckle at the situation. Now genuinely thinking back to Chi Chi when he was Pan's age, he chortles that he bets she's gonna grow up to be just the same one day. A few moments pass and Pan is seen looking at a book in bed. Hearing a tap on her door. She frantically turns off the lights and tosses the book knowing full well she's supposed to be sleeping. Opening the door, her father. Spotting the book on the ground, he lets out a smile. He sits down on the side of her bed and pretty much calls her out that she was reading longer than she was supposed to, wasn't she? This is met with a ballad of fake snoring. He assures her there's no point in pretending to sleep. Her snores are awful. In her defeat, this actually upsets her as she sits up and apologizes. Being the softy he is and seeing he upset her, he takes a moment to sit with his child. He explains that what he's about to tell her is really important, and it's going to be useful for the rest of her life. People will always try to impose their vision on her. What really matters is what she wants in her heart of hearts, so never let anyone tell her what to do. She's pure of heart. He's sure she'll never hurt anyone. This clearly mirroring Gohan's own childhood. Unfortunately, a lot of this is lost on her. She asks why he's saying all these weird words. That's when he remembers she's only three, who adorably argues she'll be three and a half soon. Knowing the training ahead of him, he gives his daughter a kiss goodnight, telling her to sleep well. Back on Sadala, Jocko stomps down right before Vegeta, snarkily interrogating if he just so happened to have recently destroyed a very expensive gadget by chance. Bluntly, the Saiyan snarls he doesn't care about his stupid gadget. And what does he want with him? And what he wants? He had to travel for two days for his wife and three scoundrels. That's when it registers with Vegeta. Oh yeah, that was part of the plan too. Heading over to the others, Khalifa scoffs that she doesn't even know what they're all doing here. And spotting the gang she was just hoping to see, Bulma greets him with a big smile. Kaba being the only one to walk up to her and say hello properly. But that could be because she doesn't think Vegeta has mentioned these other two before. Khalifa taking offense to this great affront, snarking that's not cool. The prince chuckles a bit while commenting. He didn't want to bother his wife talking about disgusting individuals such as themselves. Causing the predictable. You're joking, right? Almost as if she got her feelings hurt, Khalifa sulks off. She pouts how that made her mad and she's gonna go head home. Bulma shoots her husband a death stare, but he seems pretty satisfied with the effects his words had. When Cabot looks at his invisible watch in a panic, how inconvenient, it's getting late. He just remembered he had something to do. He has to go, right now. See ya! Not fooling anyone and only wanting to avoid this awkward situation, Vegeta swears only cowards live on this planet. Given her already timid nature, Kale thinks it'd be best if she went too. But Bulma then directs her fury towards her instead of her husband. She's just going to run away now too? Who does she think will guide him around this planet if she leaves? <laughs> Jumping back to her bubbly attitude, she says it'll be fun. That's when the inevitable happens. The female Broly locks eyes with the Broly Broly. Romance aside, what's the game plan now that Broly joins Vegeta and the others on planet Sadala? Will it be up to him to get Kaba, Khalifa, and Kale into shape as Vegeta trains the entire Saiyan army? Or does the prince plan to train everyone himself at once? <laughs> Chi-Li takes exception to the situation, shouting to Broly that she's still here. When he makes the first move, he introduces himself and questions what her name is. But Chi-Li screams to know why he's even bothering to ask. With no other words, Kale merely comments her own name in response. 
as she like cries out. How long are you going to keep ignoring me? Kale takes in a deep breath trying to overcome her anxiety. She tries to get pumped up by telling herself she can do this. Her eyes shift to a much more welcoming expression. She turns to Bulma to accept the request of escorting them around the planet. After all, it's not like there's anything better to do. Getting her way yet again, Bulma leaps with excitement and thanks their new tour guide. They can head downtown now if she wants. And since they've all finished eating, they begin to head that direction. Though already getting a rundown of the area, Vegeta complains that he doesn't like rides and this is such a pain. His wife promises this will be fun, just trust her. While Jocko snips, they just go already. Like Kale said, it's not like they have anything better to do. As Broly notices Sheila lagging behind. In a huff, she crosses her arms and pouts to Limo that she doesn't think they're invited. He asks her what's wrong. And naturally, she simply mutters, nothing. With a prod, a confused Broly inquires, she's coming too, right? Who reluctantly and eventually agrees to. The gang walks for only about half a minute before Kale announces they've reached their destination. Now we see what Vegito is referring to with the rides. It appears a Ferris wheel and roller coaster span across half the city itself. Our heroes have contrasting opinions on the Saiyan capital. While Broly thinks it's beautiful, Jocko was honestly expecting much more. She lies spitefully agreeing with the latter. Though given the last couple minutes, she would probably still have this opinion even if she were looking at Florence or Paris. Kale admits it is a pretty small city. And because of course, the behemoth asks that now that they've seen the city, what's next? Timidly, Kale thinks they can actually, you know, go into the city. Causing Chi to puff, what's there to even do down there? Are there shops or anything? All the while thinking she hopes this Kale girl won't be their tour guide this entire time they're here. Kale politely responds, of course, before soliciting she's Chi right? And in all her confident glory, the green humanoid thrusts her hands under her hips to proclaim, the one and only, her overt personality causing Limo to shake his head. The gang moves close enough to eventually start seeing people. Broly states they all seem really busy down there. And as we see, it's mostly people just casually shopping or kids playing similar to how they do on Earth. So this kind of hints to Kale that one of her visitors is a bit different than the others. She questions where he comes from. Or rather, how do things go on his home planet? He admits he's actually never done anything other than hunting before. There's neither people or much to do where he comes from. But there is Sheila and he loves her, picking her up and placing her on his shoulders. She doesn't much like being abruptly hoisted into the air. Kale tells him that's a good thing then, as we're able to pan over the area below. Vegeta scoffs he still doesn't know what they're doing here. Boma almost agrees with him. To be fair, it's really similar to Earth. Regardless, the gang heads in. The sea up close to Sadala equivalent to deep fried fair food. The simple games the kids play here, just like the ones on Earth and likely other planets. Broly crouches down to ask what they're doing. One of the children explain they're playing a game where the first person to close their eyes loses. A game Chi Lai and Kale are playing as well. Seeing the Ferris wheel, Broly wonders what the point of that thing is. They can fly. In flattering a passerby, he compliments the woman on her fancy hat. That's when they find themselves in a park-like area. A trio of shady individuals call out to him. The thug protests to the muscle man that can he see he's in their territory? With his leather jacket, it's possible these guys are from Khalifa's area. At least from what we know in the anime iteration. The other complains not only do these other Saiyans get all the fame, but now they're stealing their females as well. Something Bulma takes exception to. Do they think this is how you treat females? Telling the goons to get lost. Yes, sorry ma'am! Chi Lai approves of the scientist's actions, shooting her thumbs up. Who shudders little brats like them really get on her nerves. It seems like some things don't change no matter what universe you're in. But there is something they were right about. Maybe Broly shouldn't go walking around shirtless. It's inappropriate. <laughs> Another thing she likes about she couldn't have said better herself. Boma reaches into her jacket where she appears to be holstering several capsules and devices. She explains there must be something here for him to wear. Finding the perfect solution, she reveals something she describes as her new capsule technology. Though first, they're gonna have to get rid of this smelly thing, grabbing a Bazir. 
but just as he's done before, Broly indiscriminately reaches out to stop her. Bulma, now very concerned, lets Broly know he's hurting her. That's when Kale interjects. He can keep it. It's not a big deal. If the smell bothers her that much, she knows a good perfume maker near here. With the situation settling, Bulma states she wasn't aware how much that thing meant to him, apologizing to the Saiyan. Anyway, she instructs him to place the capsule on his chest. He also tells her not to worry about it. Placing the device around his heart area, he asks, like this? Causing the capsule to open, giving Broly a black t-shirt bearing the Capsule Corp logo. Though he complains it feels really tight. Bulma rolls her eyes for him not to be such a wimp. It's perfect. Blushing and trying to move past all this kale business, she lie mutters she thinks it fits him well. Surprisingly flattering him. With Whis and the boys on Planet Crape, it seems the angel's replaying some of Gotenks' highlights, likely trying to access a way to make him as powerful as possible for the war. The kids cheer out watching their former self in all his overconfident glory. Trunk shouts they were so cool! Turning off the video, Whis believes that's all he needed. Getting into formation, the boys begin the start of the fusion dance thinking they're finally getting to the training part. But with a lighthearted chuckle, their mentor strictly forbids them from fusing for now, causing a bit of confusion to Goten and Trunks. He goes to offer his explanation. The goal of the first part of this training is to reach the maximum level for Gotenks, for both of them individually as well. This is the best way to achieve their fullest potential. There will be three steps, the first consisting of them becoming one with their inner selves. To put it more simply, they will have to be able to unleash all their power in one blow, be it with physical contact or not. They will have to face their weaknesses, their emotions, and their inner demons. He presents the first exercise. A plastic ball resides in the center of this device. A light will appear either red or green on the top of it. When a single side of the device is hit, the red light will appear. By hitting both sides simultaneously, the green light will also appear. Therefore, their goal is to activate both lights and for the hits to be hard enough and of the same intensity so the ball in the center explodes from the pressure. To succeed, rigor, focus, and explosiveness will all be needed. Though, according to Whis himself, the hardest part will be the perfect synchronization required for the ball to explode. Presenting the machine to him, he announces it's their turn. On Sadala, Vegeta shouts for everyone's attention. The training begins now! Addressing a specific group of Saiyans, he informs they are the fifth squad. Remember that number well. They already know the three admirals standing beside him. Admiral Ruba, known for being the most powerful man on the planet. Admiral Lariak, an experienced strategist and bold warrior, the man who has won battles without ever mobilizing a single soldier. Third, Admiral Fennel. The best of the best in tactical fighting and private investigation, she has successfully dismantled 182 smuggling rings. Vegeta warns if they are wise, nobody should ever try to hide anything from her. The prince instructs the rest of his soldiers to make four mixed groups. Each group will go in front of one of the admirals or himself. Upon asking if he makes himself clear, hundreds of voices chant back, yes sir! Amping him up, Vegeta bellows he didn't hear him, has he been clear? Smirking, he thinks he's really going to enjoy this job. However, his wife and Jocko have to scoff at him. Boma comments how big-headed this is going to get him. The spaceman couldn't agree more. That's when in the crowd, Khalifa wails on a random soldier while scolding to know what he's looking at. Spotting this, Vegeta clenches his jaw at the sight that she's already acting up. He has no idea how to deal with her. He's going to have to be smart. He calls out to her, instructing she make her way to Ruba's group. But what? She thought they would get to choose their own groups. Going Super Saiyan and grabbing her by the hair, he screams at her not to argue with him. This causes Ruba to butt in. He tells Vegeta it would be better if he refrained from using that form. Turning back to him, he scowls if he heard him right. Who allowed him to address him by name? Dozens of murmurs break out in the crowd. Are they going to fight? How dare he talk to their admiral like that? If they do fight, what will be supporting Ruba? And so on. 
Fennel calls out for all the Saiyans to be quiet. What are those whisperings for? Lariac objects. Does she realize the lack of respect Vegeta is showing? But that's not the point. Reacting like that isn't appropriate for a proper Saiyan soldier. Such behavior is unworthy of them as leaders. Although, if this Vegeta has an issue with them, Ruba puffs out his chest and tells Vegeta that now he has two issues if he has a problem being addressed by name. Aside from the king, everyone is skeptical about his ability to lead him. But what is this? Now they're having doubts about his legitimacy? Looking into the crowd, the entire Saiyan army appears to be staring him down. As it seems a giant fight is about to break out, Kaba tries to be the mediator of peace. He calls for everyone to calm down. They will find a compromise. Hail backing him up on this. But Vegeta screeches for silence. It seems they have all forgotten who they're talking to. He is Vegeta. Powering up to Super Saiyan Blue, he tells every single one of them to come at him. With the training of the Saiyans more or less beginning, what will happen to Son Goku, or Universe Zero, the Angels, and Gods of Destruction? Among other issues, will Gohan live up to the Pride Troopers' expectations? And perhaps most surprising of all, Goku! Look! I'm flying! With nearly all of the Universe 6 Saiyans turning on Vegeta, he isn't about to back down and demands nothing less than their complete respect and obedience. If they can't offer him that much, they're free to come at him at this very instant. The Saiyan leaders don't seem to take this declaration well themselves, putting their focus on our hero. And with the entirety of the Saiyan army, between the pressure given the current situation and literal force emanating from his mentor, Kappa is frozen in place and doesn't know what to do. Vegeta growls that these cowards can leave if they want, but he himself won't even be able to look them in the eye afterwards. And when the day comes that the enemy comes knocking on their doors, killing all of their people, they better not come crying to him. Okay, then fight us! After effortlessly countering all three of the greatest admirals of Planet Sadala, Vegeta turns his gaze towards one of his fellow Saiyans. He states that he's looking at him like he's a monster, a bloodthirsty beast. But do they now understand how it feels to be weak? What it's like to not be able to protect your own against an enemy that is eons out of your own league? Exploding from the debris, Fennel emerges in the form of a Super Saiyan. Strangely, she apologizes to her king that she had no choice. Then urges the others to follow suit and transform as well. Repugnant. The sheer presence of King Sadala instantly puts a halt in the battle. His royalty scoffs that it seems the only thing you can count on these days are robots. Each of his admirals are more disappointing than the last. Vegeta scoffs that all this unnecessary drama aside, it would be better for everyone if he allowed them to settle their accounts here in silence! Demanding his respect, the king relinquishes them to finish their so-called accounts. He does not care about such trivial matters, but none of them are permitted to use any of these demonic forms on his planet ever again. If they do, they will be banished for eternity. This leaves many questions to be answered. Why is Sadala so against the Super Saiyan forms? Is there a story to be had here, or is it simply a personal philosophy? Whatever it may be, Vegeta powers down and calls for Bulma to follow him. Far away.
his next target appears to be somewhat of an amphibious swamp dweller. Confidently dashing away from his would-be assassin, he figures since he's been swimming at full speed for about 20 minutes, he's giving him the slip for sure. Though we see this couldn't be any less the case. Now, the time lag! As one of the rock-like growths escape the pull of hits time lag. He dodges it only for it to boomerang back around when he's not looking. Before it's destroyed by an energy beam. But by sensing its key may have been the only reason he turned around at all. Of course, the doing of Frost who continues to relentlessly stalk the stalker, meticulously taking interest in all of the assassin's unique abilities. With a sly smirk, he comments to his unwilling mentor that he's welcome. There's no need to verbally thank him. Though Hit never had any intentions of offering his gratitude. I'm playing it too. He pursues yet another bounty. Interestingly enough, one who looks to be the same species as Frost and Frieza. Then we get a view of the planet itself, which appears to defy physics with its natural mysticism and beauty. This time he's beaten to the punch altogether. Fuming, he already knows who's behind this. Frost lets out that familiar smile and chuckles that it's actually super easy to be an assassin. Grabbing him, hit the man to know what his problem is. The demon taunts. What's the matter? Can't you hit your targets anymore? Or am I just better than you? The assassin warns he will leave him alone from now until the end of time. Has he made himself clear? Though in pain from his aggressor's immense strength, Frost has but a single condition for him to meet, and he will happily comply. It must prove his superiority to him. Fight him here and now and defeat him. Meanwhile, at the Grand Priest Palace. The titular inhabitant still appears to be battling against his own body, likely due to his technique to freeze all the rebelling gods and angels in time. One of Lord Zeno's attendants approaches the throne to address him. He explains how he's tried everything he can to cover for his most recent actions, but the kings will find out about this sooner or later. Almost certainly, he refers to the two Omni Kings. The Grand Priest stutters to assure it's not a big deal, and for the attendant not to put himself in any further danger regarding the matter. While well, he seems willing to comply without retort, the Father of Angels doesn't even look like he'll be able to survive long enough to face any repercussions. Finally, we return to Gohan and the Pride Troopers, who have since changed locations. Group looks at Belmont, now mummified, likely out of respect given his current appearance. As Margarita uses her abilities to attempt life-saving measures, Top taps his foot in a myriad of emotions. At last, Gohan speaks up. He comments that if Lord Belmont is. Jiren's mere expression stops him, before he announces that Margarita has no authority to bring him back to life, nor to discredit his accumulation of years of service all at once. Nevertheless, there is still hope Lord Belmont is still with him, and if so, the only reason he still lives is because of her. While the Saiyan understands the dire tone of the situation, time is a factor for many more life forms outside Belmont, so he decides now is as good of a time as ever to tell the group how much he shares their sense of justice, which is why he'd love to be allowed to join the Pride Troopers. Turning to the new God of Destruction, still at the height of his grieving. Jiren notes that Gohan really picked the wrong time to try something like this. Realizing how unintentionally disrespectful he's been, he offers his sincerest apologies. He shouldn't have bothered him at a time like this, regardless of what's going on in the multiverse around him. A bit taken aback by his repentance, Jiren responds that it's nothing. The timing of this is no fault of his own. Top adds that they're all a bit on edge at the moment because they had to rush the divine immortality passing ritual. They don't blame him personally. Jiren states that in any case, they can't integrate him into the Pride Troopers based simply on his request alone. But if he's willing to accept their terms, 
He will accompany them all on a mission so they can evaluate him from there. With great pleasure, Gohan happily accepts their offer. As Dispo's ear twitches, he shouts for everyone to be silent. Focusing. He can hear breathing. It's extremely faint, but Lord Belmont is still alive. On Earth. Specifically Monster Island. Seventeen's out enjoying the landscape as a ship crashes down in the middle of his forest. Crawling out of the space pod. That was clearly much less of a graceful landing than he had planned on. Revealing Paparoni, one of the Universe 3 participants from the Tournament of Power. He curses that his robot here is going to need a few more tweaks. But for now, he offers a symbolic cheers to Android 17, who's instantly on the scene to see what's going on, stating he's one of those guys from Universe 3. Pepperami, right? What's he doing on his island? But this is impossible! His tracer indicated that! Minip, you have arrived! Looks like his tracer has a minor latency issue, and when you can move at Dragon Ball speeds, only a second may as well be an eternity. Either way, he introduces himself properly. He's here because he has a proposition for him. Simply put, how about teaming up? He's already gone as far as to create an android based on the DNA of the Supreme Kai of his own universe, just to come to this one. Reading through the lines, Seventeen cuts directly to the chase. So to find him, he supposes he took his own DNA too, didn't he? The doctor assures it was merely a strand of hair, nothing too crazy. Though creepiness for the means of science aside, the cyborg scolds that he better not dare try such a thing ever again. Hopping down from the tree, the interuniversal traveler meekly agrees. Alas, Seventeen isn't interested in his proposal. Paparoni implores him to think about it. What about his family? How will he defend them? He assures he doesn't need the scientists to do that. He can defend them just fine by himself. This causes his visitor to become visibly angry with his perceived arrogance. Does he not have any idea who their enemies are this time? This isn't going to be some brawl of mostly benevolent beings like in the Tournament of Power. Ever the Nihilist, the android utters that none of this matters. If you die, you die. That's just how it goes. While the doctor stunned into silence, one of Seventeen's children calls out to him from nearby. Saffir and Pearl. He demands to know what they think they're doing all the way out here. When his wife turns the corner, a bit overdressed for the middle of the forest, but she elaborates how she took him out here to play, and they overheard him talking to someone. When Saffir tells his dad they don't want to die, and they don't want him to die either. The mother assures her child that no one is going to die. They have many, many years of life left to enjoy. But the cries of the child is enough to break through the skin of even Seventeen. He remembers all the memories they've accumulated over the years and the life they have built. Reluctantly, he figures he can at least hear out what Paparoni has to offer, asking what his plan is. Naturally, he's apprehensive to trust another scientist given his past. But just how can the great inventor of Universe 3 improve Seventeen's abilities? And given how much he was able to improve on his own, one can only imagine how impossibly powerful he could still become. One month has passed since the previous events. approach. A couple soldiers call out for Gohan to show them his badge. But taking advantage of a passing crowd, containing several girls who chat about how they can't wait for their night out, who also ironically comment on the guard's good looks, give Gohan the perfect opportunity to use his speed and savvy to disappear from their eyeline. Knowing he almost blew his cover, our hero lets out a sigh of relief at his close encounter. And gazing inside a building, he spots someone in a hazmat suit pushing a cart of some kind. Quietly letting himself in, he uses his James Bond watch to question which way he should go now. 
On the other end, Jared instructs him to go to room 128 and to take the green bottle. It should be inside of a small box. It contains a devastating man-made virus. This agency wants to sell it to a neighboring country that's currently at war. Gohan must do everything he can to stop him. As he makes his way to the specified room. This must be his test mission for the Pride Troopers. He can feel the pressure of the situation. If he fails, countries, maybe an entire continent will suffer the consequences. Awkwardly stumbling in on some nefarious kind of meeting. One of the rough-looking gents questions Gohan who he is and what he's doing here. Who reveals himself to be a financial controller, and he's come to perform a financial audit. When he spots the virus. Unsure of how to approach this, he looks up and asks his father what he would do in his place. And likely just in his mind, Goku appears to him cheerfully inquiring if he needs some advice. Cautiously responding he does, Goku explains that if he were in this situation, he would evaluate the power of his opponents, so as to defeat the strongest first. That way the others would leave without fighting at all. Giggling just like his predecessor, Gohan figures he should have known, and thanks him. Peacing out just like he did against Cell, Goku vanishes as quickly as he appeared. Gohan charges a little attack while speaking to get everyone's attention. And now that he rethinks it, he's decided he doesn't need to perform an audit after all. My eyes! He tosses a variation of the solar flare and takes off with the virus. He has to apologize for not heeding his father's advice, but he'd rather do this without hurting anyone if he can. Come back here! If he remembers the orientation of this building correctly, one more turn should get him out of here. He's kinda right. Though he runs into the guards from before. Immediately after, he turns around to find himself surrounded. It looks like he may have to get physical after all. Not long later, Dispo questions what they're doing now. But Jiren doesn't know. It seems like they've been sitting on their hands for a little while now. Casserole phones in to see if everything's going to plan on their side of things. Unfortunately, they haven't heard back from Gohan for 30 minutes. He tells them that if they don't hear back from him within an hour, they need to intervene. He's also called to give them some news regarding Lord Belmont. Getting their attention, they panically ask how he's doing. And he's actually with Casserole right now. The Cloud himself boasts he's been through a lot, but it'll take more than that to take him down especially given their fates are at the mercy of a devastating war that has nothing to do with them. Back on Planet Crepe with Whis and the Boys. We resume their training with the ball. If memory serves correct, they have to simultaneously hit the ball with the same amount of force to complete this exercise, among other precise stipulations. Trunks lashes out at Goten in frustration. He tells him that his hand was off and they need to do it again. His counterpart does his best to focus. Tapping into his own mind, he finds a sense of calm. He thinks the words, get in touch with yourself. He then finds himself in a strange metaphysical realm and in front of a door. He approaches it wondering what in the world this is and what it means and what he's doing here. Most curious, what's behind this door? We did tell him to face their demons. Could this be related? The only thing he knows for sure is that he feels some kind of pressure. But interrupting a strain of thought, the muffled voice of Trunks comes crashing into him. Counting down. Goten shouts at him at the last moment for him to stop. He tries to explain that he saw a door in his head when he was trying to focus. Naturally, this only confuses his friend. What the heck is he talking about? Is this some kind of joke? And the truth is, Goten doesn't really know what it means. Annoyed, he asks Whis if he cares to enlighten them further on this. 
who doesn't appear to have any intentions of doing so. Feeling this is as good of a stopping point as any, Trunks plops on the ground for a rest. Goten notes that without fusing, this is a lot harder than expected in terms of strength, but maybe strength is an attribute they need to look beyond, prompting the angel to smile. The boys are starting to get it. At Gohan's house, after being put down for bed for the evening, it looks like Pan isn't quite done with her own adventures yet. Taking off, she's excited to get to train. Piccolo told her to join him in the southwestern forest the day she's ready. So despite Videl's intense protests, it looks like Gohan's daughter will get to have the same mentor as her father after all. Who can sense she's decided to join him? After training with his fellow Namekians, Polina and Saunel, he wants to see everything they can do since the Tournament of Power. How much has his Namekian brethren managed to improve in the last two years? Saunel seems confident with this question. Simply tells him he'll see. They've developed a new technique. Tossing off his cloak, Piccolo wants to see this for himself. 20 minutes later, Pan spots the trio in the middle of a clearing. With the three of them reaching their apex, Piccolo has to hand it to him. They surely have gotten a lot stronger since their initial fight but they taught him something very interesting about the Namekian race. But Pan interrupts whatever this reveal may be. She's ready to train too. One month prior, we rejoin Hit and Frost and miss their standoff. For whatever reason, the Frost Demon has a death wish. He's decided to challenge Hit to a fight to see who the better assassin truly is. The pressure rises little by little. The first one to attack will almost certainly be the winner. Because at such a level. Each move can be decisive. Using one of his trademark attacks, it doesn't waste any time in proving to Frost that he's still in way over his head. He wonders how his adversary even managed to do that. It's like he can feel his hand on his own heart. It's as if he is squeezing it and immobilizing the rest of his body with chains. Regardless, he knows he must somehow resist. Doing so, Frost laughs out with a maddening timbre. He cackles that was close, but now it's his turn. And he believes he knows exactly what he must do to hurt him. He sneers that he thinks he was wrong about Hit. He doesn't hate his life at all. On the contrary, he loves it, lacerating his victims, tormenting them as they have no hope of survival or escape. His life must actually be the greatest of pleasures. Distracting him by making him look over his shoulder, Frost delivers a blow straight to the heart in return, assuring no hard feelings. It's merely the lull of retaliation. Though as just revealed, this punch wasn't as significant as he first believed. A baffled Frost questions if these things are clones or something. But no. It tells them they are all one. As they all simultaneously attack their foe. It looks like Frost managed to escape a close call. He almost ended up like Frieza when he first fought Goku. Almost. He struggles to retain consciousness. As the last thing he sees before his vision fades to black is the approach of the assassin, who has effortlessly ended so many. Jumping forward one month again, Vegeta decided to continue training the Saiyans after all, though complying with King Sadala's demand of only using his base form. He scoffs at his sparring partner that his technique has too many tells, and it's embarrassingly obvious when and where he intends to strike. He has to know the difference between going headlong and deliberately creating an opening for a counterattack. Actually, they all should probably heed that advice. 
He tells the students to take a break and they'll resume within 10 minutes. It seems to be these are the only Saiyans who decided to stick around for his training. The others may have opted out altogether. One of which calls out to thank him, seeing the vast chasm between them. Even though there are many of them, training this law still fills the prince with pride. He touches down elsewhere to hear a familiar voice explaining to Khalifla what her problem is. But before he can even begin, she starts arguing that she doesn't understand anything he's been trying to tell her. He said to prepare a move in advance, but also told her to rely simply on her instincts. It's contradictory. Ruba interjects that one does not prevent the other. He's learned at his own expense that going straight into a pile only leads to a brick wall. But no matter how hard he tries, he can't make a plan until he takes action. So he started preparing a plan B in the middle of battle. So she has to drive into the wall, but think about how to destroy its foundations if she doesn't break through it in one go. In other words, use your instincts first, but simultaneously devise a plan for if and when that fails. Stumbling upon this conversation, he's glad to see they're doing well for themselves. Ruba greets Vegeta, who corrects, that's Mr. Vegeta to him. Taking off, the brute is left to only shout his protests in the distance, as Khalifla calls out to her next opponent that she doesn't know who he is, but he's gonna suffer now because she's come up with a plan B. With at least Fennel, Broly, and Kale, the former insists that Broly has to accept the energy within him. He must stop resisting it and deal with it. As for the young lady, she has to gain confidence. She refuses to believe in her own reasonings and that's what blocks her. She reminds Kale that she is a very smart woman. That much is obvious. She's felt this way since the day she met her. Vegeta reinforces these words. He utters to Kale that if she believes in what Fennel's telling her, she'll go far. And not too far away, Lariac informs Kaba in the month they've gotten to know each other. He's seen his own youth within him. He lets himself get carried away by his emotions. But a true Saiyan is not like that. Kaba's logic, patience, and bravery must take precedence over his instinct, haste, and doubts. He straightens his posture and assures he understands. As Vegeta's voice chimes in behind him, he requests if he can pull him aside to talk for just a minute. Reflexively asking what for, the prince returns to his brash nature and barks he not ask questions. As night falls, a select group finds themselves at some old ruins. A cold wind cuts through the air while an ill-dressed Khalifla shivers and demands to know what they're even doing out here. Kaba informs it was Vegeta who requested he gather them all here. Who states he'll be brief. After seeing all their groups today, their respective admirals seem to still have a lot to teach all of them. Which is good. But as far as the fight is concerned, they're already far beyond them. Transforming, the prince wants to meet up with them every night to face each other in their best forms. And Khalifa can't wait. She's been waiting for what feels like forever to let loose. Everyone else also seems to have no objections in going against the king's demands. Still a little confused about his own abilities, Broly spectates Kale. Vegeta orders him to retake that form that he had when the two of them fought, no matter how out of control he gets. However, he retorts that since that day, he has never taken the state again. In fact, he only has vague memories of it. Well, that's indeed a bit of an issue. He calls on Kale to teach him. The two of them have gotten close enough and are similar in a way that makes her the best choice for the task. She agrees to do so without hesitation. With everything set in motion, Broly's regular Super Saiyan should suffice in the meantime. Everyone gets in position for some real training that will push them to their limits. What has happened to Frost? Has the assassin taken him out for good? Or does he merely plan on leaving him maimed? And what has happened with Gohan on his test mission with the Pride Troopers? On Sadala, a battle worn Vegeta is seen gazing into the sky. Below, the native Saiyans, all exhausted.
Leafla compliments that there's no doubt about it. Broly's potential is really the same as Kale's. Something the prince agrees with. He's reached a level that he never dreamed of. His strength couldn't be more distinguished from what he showcased during their fight on Earth. He tells Kale that she really impressed him last night. She will definitely be a great teacher for Broly. As for Khalifla, she'll need to make use of this new stage she herself has reached as well. She must train herself to maintain this form and reach it with more and more ease. However, since this isn't blatant praise, she scoffs if it would rip his tongue out to show a little pride in her. But she shouldn't think he doesn't. On the inside, she knows this. But it's time to get back. It's pretty much daytime now. Later, the gang approaches a group of Saiyans who are training with the Admirals. As one of them powers up, Kaba asks what's going on. Did they decide to get started early today or something? When in fact, nobody wanted to go home last night, so they've been here since yesterday. With a hand on his hip, Vegeta comments that he's glad to see that they're all beginning to understand. As the Saiyan he sparred with the other day thanks him yet again. Because of him, he feels he can now fully exploit his potential, and he's not the only one. As a variety of other warriors stand in attention, giving respect to the one who's going to make them so much more powerful. Even a kiddo resembling a hero from another story. The Saiyan explains that all of these guys are friends and friends of friends. When he told them about his training, they got a taste for combat. When a man resembling a lesser moustached Paragus smiles to Vegeta that it's nice to meet him. He's the dean in a region about 2,000 kilometers from here. He was intrigued by the story of a man who said he would train the Saiyans like the good old days. Another, a former soldier, heard the same thing and figured it was time for himself to get back to work. Although a bit quiet at first. Vegeta explains to the gang that they must be aware of the ultimate end that awaits them all, referring to their participation in the war. If he's to train them all as well, they have to be aware of the risk that comes with it. Logically, they have no choice. If they don't fight, nobody will fight for them. If they have to die, they may as well fight to the end. After all, nobody is ever truly ready. And this is all the prince needs to hear. He figures it's about time they came around. Uttering his name for the first time in a while, Vegeta thinks out to Kakarot. They may very well win this war. Away. Sporting an awkward face, Bulma has to admit that as they've got to know each other, she herself has divulged a lot about her own children, but she never says anything about hers. And panning to what I at first thought was Kale dulled to the max, this mystery lady replies that Bulma already knows the most important thing about her kids. Pepino, her son, is the same age as Trunks, at least the one not from the future, who herself has to laugh at the confusion time travel causes but she thinks they would get along just fine. Her friend assures that as crazy as it all seems, she believes her. After all, there are many unbelievable things happening lately. Learning this woman's name is Rapini, Bulma questions if her husband would ever consider training with Vegeta. They've been palling around for an entire week now, but she doesn't think she's ever even seen him. And this causes Rapini to bellow out with laughter. Her husband fighting? She'd like to see that. Which is quite strange. A Saiyan who doesn't like battle? There's a first time for everything. However, this man isn't a Saiyan, but a Tuffle. Worth noting that aesthetically, the Tuffles typically don't resemble Baby from Dragon Ball GT or Common and Orin from Heroes. At least these Tuffles don't, and appear much more human looking. But Bulma finds this interesting. Back home, they've long since been wiped out. They still exist here? Of course they do. They've been living with the Saiyans on Sadala for more than 200 years. And it's thanks to them that the king has such efficient guards. Which now makes sense why they're robots. Tuffles typically spend most of their time in their laboratories north of the capital. They work day by day to protect each family more efficiently. Our own scientist has to point out this is yet another thing their sons have in common. Each of them is only 50% Saiyan. Because Pepino isn't entirely a Saiyan. He has the intelligence and creativity of his father. And the strength of his mother's people. He's a truly brilliant child. And she's not merely gushing on because she's his mom. Anyway, it may be. Bulma hopes she'll be able to introduce her to both her husband and child. Rapini appreciates the kindness and would like that. And probably with ulterior motives. 
Bulma shoots a sly look and inquires if it would be possible for her to visit the Tuffle Labs. Which under normal circumstances, it would be very difficult to gain entry, even with a permit. But she's in luck! She's in the presence of a great woman who has a great husband, who happens to be coming home tomorrow. So, it's entirely possible he just may happen to agree to take them both there. Beaming! This means she could go as soon as tomorrow? And that's the case. As Bulma makes us begin to question her platonic faculties, she shouts for Rapini to get in her arms. They're about to revolutionize Sedalian technology. The native, however, warns for her to be ready. She's about to see. The highest level of technology in Universe 6. We jump back a month to when Krillin and the others first made contact with the trio de danger. Basil wants to clear everything up now that they're away from the noise of the market. He wants to know what they're doing in this godforsaken hole of the universe. Krillin explains how Gohan said it would be rewarding to train with the three of them to prepare for the upcoming war. This causes the wolves to belly laugh at the idea. A war? What's all this about a war now? As our heroes look back at each other dumbfounded, Tien tells how the Grand Prix sent a message out to every universe. Do they simply not remember? A message? What message? Growing blue in the face. This means that. His message must have been stopped by the clouds which cover this planet. Kind of like trying to watch satellite TV on a stormy day. Kazin Yapcha to question if this means there are thousands of planets who don't even know about the war because of problems like this. Focusing on one problem at a time, Krillin figures he'll just have to explain everything. Moments later, the trio de danger quickly come around to the idea of some training. Bergamo doesn't want to waste any more time in getting to it. He wants to see what these guys are worth. Seeming to hold their own, Lavender admits he didn't think they'd be so promising. Basil adds that the two bald ones weren't this effective in the Tournament of Power. He doesn't understand why, though. But the former thinks he has an idea. These three are like the three of them. Their real strength comes from their collaboration. Separated, their lack of individual power is all the more glaring. Ready, guys? Giving it their all. It wasn't even enough to really put a damper on Bergamo's day. He does compliment them regardless of the outcome. He turns to Basil to request him to find this group a place to rest. Meanwhile, on Sidra's planet in Universe 9, the Destroyer himself talks to the sinister Kaioshin Ro about how they have two years to finalize their little scheme. They need to get ahead of them and strike first before they're able to react. This conversation gets the attention of Mojito, the angel. He questions the pair on what they're discussing. Ro assures it's nothing at all, nothing important at least. But given the situation that every being now finds himself in, the angel gets a little more serious. 
He tells them he asked a question and he would like an answer. Again, Sidra informs that they're not talking about anything and he shouldn't worry, as this is a less than satisfactory answer. He informs the duo that he will be watching them all the more closely from now on. Ro assures him it's anything but what he must be thinking. He can promise them that they will never, ever allow each other to act recklessly without consulting each other in the face of such divine conflict. With nothing further to add, the angel simply tells him, good. Waking up wrapped in bandages. Yamcha jostles that he told him he'd be able to wake up without a senzu bean. He's a big boy. But Tien doesn't really want to hear this cockiness right now. He tells him to thank their host for being so kind. Krillin chuckles looking at himself. All these wounds just from a little spar. What'll happen when they're faced with more numerous and bloodthirsty enemies? Optimistic, Yamcha reminds that they have a little less than two whole years. They'll simply learn. However, given the overcast situation here, how will they even know when the war starts? Luckily, Lord Sidra and Lord Ro will alert everyone. They can trust them. Lavender has to chuckle and ask if the tall bald guy can just see through the clouds with that third eye of his. Which everyone minus Tien gets a kick out of. Though in all seriousness, Basil wants to know what's up with that thing anyway. Tien explains that he's a descendant of the Three-Eyed Clan. As the name so cryptically suggests, they all typically have this distinguishing feature. Unfortunately, in large, they no longer exist anymore. During his childhood, the wise men of his clan liked to tell legends about the presence of this third eye. Some spoke of a divine presence, others a prophetic sign, and people outside the clan saw them as demons. His elders had always taught him to use his difference to add to his strength and identity. He then joined the crane school and met Shoutsu, his best friend. But one day, while returning to the village, his family had vanished into thin air. He spent so many years looking for him, but trailing off at the thought, Tian decides to skip a few memories and jump to the ones we know. He tells how he made the decision to make the crane school his second family. Afterwards, he met Yamcha, Krillin, and son Goku while they were studying in a rival school. But returning to the topic of his third eye, it's nothing more than a physical characteristic. Nothing to do with the ancient prophecies or anything like that. Trying to hold in his laughter, Yamcha snorts that they really do have everything back on Earth, so it's no wonder they never found Tien strange. Or for that matter, he's never thought much of Krillin not having a nose either. For the love of God, the king of the planet is a talking dog! Which is especially ironic to bring up given the present company. As Krillin grumbles for him to stop staring, Yamcha reveals that the three of them are great as a team, but it might not really ever be the same again if he's being honest. Bergamo fiercely implores he elaborate what he means. Wearing his emotions on his sleeve, Krillin explains that Goku was in Universe 19 when it was sealed. They don't know if he's alive or dead. Even if he is alive, there's no telling what condition he'll be when that universe is set back to normal. He's their biggest piece and they're probably going to have to do this without him. Again with his optimism, Yamcha states Goku is still with them. He's in their hearts. He taught them all a lot of things, and he always proved to them that it's never too late. They'll win this war, and he'll retrieve Goku himself from the hands of their enemies. A month after, Krillin and the others began their training with the warriors of Universe 9. We bring ourselves back to the Universe 7 Earth. Specifically, Krillin and 18's house. Still in ruins from Goku and Beerus' immense battle. Paparoni. Again, the Universe 3 fighter who controlled all the team's artificial lifeforms in the tournament, explains with heavy pride that Shinbot is very useful to travel between universes. But he does admit that he still needs to work out a few problems with it. For example, you have to wait a month between uses, so it's not exactly practical in every situation. Worth noting, Shinbot is the name of the DNA-based robot from Universe 3 that uses the Supreme Kai's genetics as a reference for its abilities. However, Given he's already been on Earth for 30 days now, he's already lost enough time in achieving what he set out to do in the first place. And since the robot is all charged up, the cyborg twins figure it's time to go. Excited. 18 offers an anxious stress as she spouts she's ready. She owes it to her husband for the sake of their families. They all need to get back on track with their own preparation for what's to come. Kneeling down to bid goodbye to his kids, Seventeen tells them that he'll be back soon, and they need to take care of their mother while he's gone. 
His sister comments something similar to her own child, smiling to Marin to help out her aunt, and she's counting on her. As Safra and Pearl wave their respective parents off, their mother, who probably also has a name, warns her husband to be careful, who shoots her a Goku pose and promises to do so. So is Shimba finally ready? They just need to enter the coordinates and a trip will be almost instantaneous. But we seem to have a little bit of unfinished business here. With a familiar gruffiness, Mr. Satan nervously calls out to the gang. Greeting them, he reveals that they've come to Paparoni at the request of the mayor. The only electronic devices still working at the town hall burned out, and this happened only after indicating the position of Krillin's house. Here, for a brief second. Has the war started? Or is this some kind of false alarm? The scientist quells his worries that the war definitely hasn't started. They're simply preparing for a journey to his own native world. They just now activated his Shimbot, which must have disrupted the magnetic network. Apologizing for the inconvenience, he bequesters who this mustache gentleman is. But who is he? He's only the strongest man in the world. With a smirk, Paparoni regrets to inform that if he is indeed the strongest, he doesn't remember seeing him in the Tournament of Power. This only prompts the warrior who famously rid the planet from the likes of Cell to scoff at the visitor's arrogance. He is the great Mr. Satan, world renowned for his extraordinary martial arts skills. When suddenly, it's like his left hand hit a brick wall. Sapphire snatches his. Is it, is it Sapphire or Sa Sapphire? That's Sapphire. Sweet. Sapphire snatches his fist, hissing that the fatty get out of the way. He almost hit their sister. The child's mother walks over to tell her kin not to be so rude. And for different reasons than myself. Her presence causes Hercules' eyes to bulge out of his head. Stuttering, he exclaims she's Crystal, the supermodel star. And that's right. She smiles and replies that she already understands that he's Mr. Satan, world champion of martial arts. Causing his eyes to spontaneously morph into horrific sclera solitary fibrous tumors. Gushing at the fact that she of all people would actually know who he is. Although... Paparoni asked a question how famous this guy actually is to be acting in such a manner, which 18 doesn't even want to begin to get into. As this nonsensory goes on, Boo finds himself fixated on a particular object. Inspecting the Shimba while everybody's distracted. He angrily steams. What is this thingy? And he swallows a hole. Dashing over as fast as she can to try to stop what's happening. 18 frantically wonders why this guy has to always show up at the worst possible time. Unable to help. Both Shimba and Boo disappear in the flash of light. Shouting out to Paparoni, she questions where they went. Showing defeat in his expression, the scientist details how Boo activated the robot without entering new coordinates. The fact that he teleported means the destination was chosen randomly when Shimba was in his mouth. Meaning, It'll be impossible to find either of them. Though 18 argues that there was a location selected before, right? Why wouldn't it just send them there? And the truth is, there was a location selected, but it was just here in Universe 7. The problem is that if Shimbot is gone, it's because the location was changed while Boo was eating it, as he just explained. With a sigh, 17 groans that he knew all of this would eventually amount to nothing. And of course, Mr. Satan doesn't understand a thing of what's going on. This pizza guy's magic tricks are cool and all, but where's Majin Buu? While unknown to them, he has arrived in none other than the Demon Realm. In Universe 11, we rejoin Gohan in his mission with the Pride Troopers, while trying to steal a virus which was developed to be sold to the highest bidder. One of the bad guys bellows that there's no way our hero's getting out of here with that bottle, commanding him to put it down in his hands up. into the air. He had wished he could do this without hurting anyone, but they've left him no choice. As 
Gohan handles his adversaries with ease. Jiren and Dispo ready themselves to move in. They're going to go through the same window Gohan used to gain access to the facility. Spotting the Saiyan, Dispo inquires why Gohan didn't answer them when they were trying to contact him. Shooting the pair a smile and thumbs up, it looks like he was able to catch the container in time. He apologizes for the concern, but it got a little hectic. Leaving the rabbit to then question why he came all the way down here. Unsure what he means. The trooper refers to why didn't he just use the same window as he did to initially get in here. He probably could have avoided a lot of this chaos. And now that he mentions it, that's a pretty good point. Moments later, the villains are seen being escorted to a paddy wagon by the local army. Likely a simple alternative to having a police force in this world. One of the guards of the building shouts for him to wait. He's a soldier too. He works for the government. But alas, his cries fall on deaf ears. Jiren compliments Gohan. He caused more fear than harm and managed to succeed in his mission. When he's approached by the rest of the troopers, led by Kassaro, showing a degree of satisfaction, he admits the young man has done his duty. Moreover, Jiren and Dispo have praised his merits and bravery. He had indeed already proven himself at the Tournament of Power, but he has now confirmed their expectations by yet again proving his ability to serve the innocent. In short, all of this talk amounts to swearing him in as their newest brother. As of tonight, Sun Gohan is the 56th member of the Pride Troopers. After this accomplishment, the Pride Troopers headed off to a fancy restaurant to celebrate. Casserole hicks out his congrats to the Saiyan, and although likely somewhat ethanol-influenced, he proclaims that he doesn't know him well enough yet, but he already loves him. Zori calls out for the general to calm down. He's coming on a little strong. Laughing along with the group, Kokadi assures Gohan not to mind him. He's always like this. Who's fine with all the attention? After all, you need to decompress after a mission. But referencing the general's mental state, Dispo quips that it isn't Casserole who went on the mission. Detracting, the former asks Gohan to tell everyone a little more about his family. They all know his father, but that's about it. Who explains how he has a younger brother named Goten and his mother Chi Chi. She's an exemplary mother who always wanted him and his brother to succeed, and he loves her very much. And then there's his wife Fidel and daughter Pan. But he has a daughter? Dispo congratulates him on this. She must be adorable. Does he have a picture? And he does opening his wallet to show an image of the three of them. The rabbit is awestruck by the scene, before reaching into his jacket pocket to show him a picture of his own. He too is a dad. Although, his litter appears a lot more... of a handful than Gohan's. Chuckling, the Saiyan sarcastically chortles that he has a small family. Returning the look, Dispo tells how this is just the latest litter. He's very proud of him. But... Uh... He means there are other litters? As Kettle alerts everyone that someone has just arrived. Seen better in much worse days. It's Belmod, top following behind. The former destroyer tells how he crossed paths with death, but the current between he and the Reaper wasn't strong enough. So he decided to return. Meanwhile, on Planet Crepe, Still trying to sink their key and complete their first bit of training, the one where they have to hit the ball at the same time. Trunks feels at a loss. There seems to be nothing they can do. It looks like the only lead that they have is to rely on the weird door Goten saw on his head. This might be the only way for them to succeed, but he too needs to see it. Goten reassures his friend that he can do it. If he himself can, there's no reason he can't. Closing his eyes, he figures he doesn't have much of a choice. Concentrating. and finding himself in the same realm as Goten did. The boy looks around asking if it worked. As Goten calls out to him, they realize they can hear each other, but not see each other. Either way, Trunks tells him that he can see the door now. He thinks they should open it. Without much more in this place, that is likely the only thing they can do. But as Goku's youngest son approaches it, he sees something in the reflection. It's... Go tanks? His opposite sees the same. It's pretty strange. He does everything Goten himself is doing. 
Same with trunks. When for a split second, the boys see each other instead of the fused warrior. So maybe. Goten shouts on the count of three for Trunks to raise his right hand and spread his fingers. Counting. The pair see each other plain as day. When the door opens to reveal Gotenks. But weren't they supposed to face their demons behind this door? That's what we said at least. But this explains everything. Their demons, or rather demon, is him. Which, duh, but better explained. With fusion, there's no need to calibrate and sync with each other. Everything is automatic once they become a single being. So they're gonna have to read each other without relying on fusion to do so. With the game plan set, it's now or never. Finishing with perfect sync. That was too easy. The boys chuckle that Whis is gonna have to train him harder next time. Though their hubris precedes them, their attitude puts the angel at ease. When something catches his focus, after several millennia, Lord Beerus has finally decided to return. But to where is he returning? On the destroyer's planet. The Oracle Fish states that Whis is left with the two Saiyan children. So now it's Beerus' turn to leave as well? He can't leave them all alone! What's he going to do here by himself? And that's simple. He just has to go to Earth. There's plenty of good things to eat there. But the Anguilla Laformis wonders why he can't just tag along with the Destroyer. But it's because where Beerus is going is no place for him. Causing the Elipomorpha, or at least Eumetazoa, to refute that the journey will be long, and the Felis Caddis will need company. To which the Felidae wistfully replies, with this war approaching, the only company he needs is that of the perpetuity of silence. So he will be going alone, and that is his final decision. As he dons an unfamiliar garb, the Oracle Fish mentions that Beerus only wears that outfit on very rare occasions who reveals that he only wears it when he goes home, bowing to his father that he'll be back soon. Entering his native world. He's missed this feeling. Planet Gezi. makes his approach to someone else who beat him here. Rhetorically asking if he decided to come too. Champa. He scoffs that he's been waiting for Beerus for like a month now. And if we look at the formation of stones in front of him, it reads pair, or rather, dad. Beerus comments to his father that he hasn't been here in over a thousand years. When Shampa questions how he might have acted had he found himself in the same situation as they. This whole thing is one giant headache. His brother smirks that he's sure his dad would do a whole lot better than Champa at least. Who lovingly tells his sibling to speak for himself. Back with the boys, as Goten begins to wake up, confused, he asks Whis if they made it. Already conscious, Trunks is happy to see his friends slept well. The angel reveals that they will now enter the second stage of their training. They must now unlock their godly potential. It's a necessary step to reach stage three of their preparation. But God Key, if this is step two, what on earth could be included in step three? Their mentor simply wishes them luck. Before welcoming them to planet Lestia, here are two spheres of God Key. The only advice Whis has for them, they must assimilate them. But that's all? The kids laugh that he has to be kidding. Shutting his eyes, their teacher informs that is the very case. Assimilate an orb apiece. After they manage to do so, the step will be completed. While both spheres slowly make their way towards the kids, they feel they're going way too slow. 
until they charge after him. And after the energy merges with the duo. It's strange, but not unbearable. When their Genkai spirit orbed by the key, Whis chuckles that perhaps he should have warned them, apart from their fathers. No mortal has ever survived these spheres, and this is accounting for millions of years of trying. It's a miracle that both of them are still conscious. Writhing in pain, Goten grunts what this thing is. What are they supposed to do? But Trunks has a different reaction. Screeching, he will become stronger than his father. Trying to hold on and cursing through the agony. But the pair collapse and the energy leaves their bodies, causing their mentor to wonder if he overestimated them. Although, it's not like these spheres were even fully charged. With his face in the water, Goten questions if when we said assimilate, he means they have to keep these orbs inside themselves. Which is exactly what he means. In other words, all of that pain just now was for nothing. But Trunks rests on his resolve that he will surpass his dad, no matter what. Who, at the same time, meditates in Universe 6 on Sadala. The training here intensifies as well. The Saiyans face the fields of action and the limits of their potential. Hale and Broly seem to still be focused on helping the latter better control himself. She tells the giant he's almost there. While the others also discover unexpected aptitude. When? The group receives an unexpected and unfortunate visitor. Spotting the king, who has already warned them against using their Super Saiyan forms for reasons unknown. Vegeta tells everyone to keep going. He'll be back. Meeting with the ruler face to face. He utters to the royal that he's seen him coming more and more to see the Saiyans exercise. But naturally, his next step should be to participate in the training. However, the king throws him a curveball, demanding that he and his friends leave this planet at dawn. But what? Is he joking or just foolish? Narrowing his glare, Vegito was warned, summoning his guards. Though the guards are easy work, the king seems to stop Vegeta's fist with only his mind. Our prince pleads he listen. After socking him in the face, the royal stares into Vegeta's soul, hissing that to think this man taught his people to defend themselves. Vegeta and his allies are nothing but traitors to the Saiyan race. But what on earth could Sadala have against the Super Saiyan form? Broly sees what's going on, but only wonders what Vegeta will do. And not too surprisingly, the Saiyan only smiles at this. So here is the true face of the pacifist king. Although he is much stronger than he thought. Hitting the key barrier! Quick! Why didn't you even bother to show up in the tournaments against us? You could have protected your own! Ow! Just as the Universe 7 warrior thinks he's going to throw a left, he launches a flying knee instead. but manages to get him with his right hand. Never have I encountered such an affront from a Saiyan. You will leave this planet by force! This is interesting, but you keep holding back your true abilities! As 
Vegeta moves in after changing to Super Saiyan. The king drops his guard to only shield his eyes. But why? He finally demands that it's time for him to explain. What makes him hate this form so much, even though it's only a multiplier of power? Stoller remains silent, covering his face. While speculation begins to break out amongst the native Saiyans. One of the admirals shouts for everyone to get back to training. But Kappa can't help but wonder what Vegeta's trying to do. Better late than never, King Sadala gives the reason for his hatred. He explains that this demonic form with the golden hair took over his own body for the first time, the same night Gherkin took the life of the previous king. Remember, Gherkin was the evildoer that the current Sadala defeated to take the throne. But along with this form, this golden evil, it took away hundreds of innocent lives along with the lives of his enemies. Women, children, brothers in arms. The overwhelming power caused by the transformation amplified his hatred into an endless rampage. The image of a child carrying a sister's body within the flames still haunts him to this day. That form is only the manifestation of evil. A form only attainable under such hatred cannot be healthy and will end up driving its user into madness. Prompting Vegeta to shout that Kaba has achieved the very same transformation but through the devotion to protect none other than Sadala himself. Would an evil, hate-driven demon really team up with the king just to protect him? But he's not persuaded, believing one cannot be sure who's truly one's own people. Not once even the devout admit they are nothing more than a desperate, starving man. Now growing frustrated, Vegeta wants to know who exactly the king thinks he's dealing with. What makes them who they are can't be reduced to a singular analogy, or in the literal sense, a singular physical form. It's nonsense to judge someone based on anything besides their actions. But all too often, the actions they're least proud of stick out the most. Any way you look at it though, the Super Saiyan form is just a weapon like any other. The key is to use it wisely. However, the heavy burden Vegeta just displayed in his eyes isn't lost on the king. The look of regret from the bottom of his soul. With a slight pause, he admits that in the past, he massacred entire civilizations for nothing more than pleasure. Leading Sadala back to his point, what did he just tell him? This demonic form made him crazy. But what he doesn't know is that the Super Saiyan was a mere legend at the time. He didn't even really believe it existed. He was in his normal state, and more or less, sound mind upon committing these slaughters. Though now all is well for himself, and today, it's up to Sadala himself to rid himself from the burden he carries. Possibly getting through. The king has yet another question. Kaba has told him a lot about Vegeta. He said he was a man who loved his people. So what made him change and become aware of his horrific actions? Who actually snickers a bit at this? Gazing upwards, he would like to tell him that it's only because his wife and children. But the truth is that he owes it to his encounter with a warrior who is greater than himself. A few years ago, he understood where true happiness and true justice resided. The Earth, the planet he attacked, his planet. It became Vegeta's home too, where he started a family. Without this unnamed warrior, he wouldn't be the same as he is today. And it's precisely because of these transformations, and each time his rival surpassed himself, that caused him to admire him more and more, in spite of his own pride. The Super Saiyan form opened his eyes to what is right, opened his eyes to this friend. He continues. He states Sadala fell to his knees not knowing how to get up, but he himself understands. He too would have probably acted even less wise had he been in his place. Remembering back to his brothers lost due to his rampage. King Sadala decides that it's time to finally say goodbye. As Sadala Saiyans belt out in celebration, the royal would look down upon his people, those cheering and laughing. It wasn't until now that the king understood the true value of what's in front of him. Meanwhile, in Universe 7 on Earth, Videl coaches her dad, calling out that he's almost there. Everyone participating in the war has to find their own way. Even the weakest are making their contribution to the cause. 
as so much as the likes of Mr. Satan begins to learn key use. Will they really be ready in time? But with the motivation and stakes never higher, what choice did they have? Though things are beginning to rumble in Universe 14. And Universe Zero. Our heroes are about to face a threat they can't yet even imagine. In an unfamiliar place, over and over again, a strange looking man shouts, Venerable Air! Appearing to try to wake someone from their sleep. As whoever he's talking to opens his eyes, the person is elated to see that he's finally awake. But who are these two? The man continues to try to explain that he doesn't know what happened. He can't remember anything. He has a huge gap in his memory. Maybe he knows something about it. But the so-called venerable heir only shakes his head. Revealing a bit more of the room, the talkative little guy tells how when he woke up himself, a few minutes ago, this door was locked. Bewitched even as it couldn't be opened no matter what. Luckily, it was just a primal spell, like it was made to only stop them from going out without slobbering too much. Or rather, still without all their cognitive faculties from their long sleep. Of course, the man proclaims, a brilliant wizard like himself would have saved the both of them from any situation they would have faced. As big and quiet at last says his first words, Salaga, where is he? Answering the question with an instruction, the wizard runs towards the door requesting his ally follow. Although the light to the outside world is blinding, he ushers his follower, after you. Welcoming us all to Universe 14, Planet Bread. The duo emerge from what appears to be a piece of futuristic technology. On an otherwise decimated world. Taking it all in for the second time, the wizard assures that he knows what the venerable heir is feeling. He too is taken by surprise a few moments ago upon laying eyes on their surroundings. When another figure makes his way onto the scene, the aforementioned Salaga. The heir simply looks over to him and questions what the deal is with his outfit, as it's all tattered and battle-worn. The demon-looking warrior details how it was impossible for them to wake their heir up, so he took the initiative himself to venture through the outside world. That's what he found himself facing a horde of creatures made of pure energy. He had to adapt to the situation, knowing each of their attacks were sapping away his vitality. He knew he had to be patient. Because of this, he managed to copy their vitality absorption ability and was able to overcome them. The fight was hard, but not without experience gained. And the mission to protect him, the venerable heir, has been successful. <laughs> Casting what is presumably a healing spell on the warrior, the wizard shouts Salaga as impressive as always. As the other man of the company takes in a story. Moving the conversation, Slaga requests to address their heir on an important matter. The thing is, these bewitchments, these energy creatures, are strangely familiar to those of Lord Dramel, the god of destruction of Universe 14. While greatly alarming, why would Lord Dramel want to lock the three of them up? This is absurd! But to echo these worries, the heir states that this is indeed what he himself has also concluded. Any telepathic contact with him or Zeres, the Destroyer's Angel, seems to be ineffective. He then suggests they all go directly to his planet to find out, finally naming the wizard as Dula, and demanding he summon the mothership. Who so enthusiastically gets to it, smiling for him to consider it done. Causing a giant ship to emerge from beneath the smog of the planet's surface. He shouts that it feels like it's been ages since he's got to use his powers. Before the three of them embark, Slaga showcases another unique ability. It's just as he thought and feared. The air's heartbeat is irregular, and his blood pressure is unstable. But what could this mean? He can't help but address him yet again, begging to be excused, but... As 
their eyes meet. Salaga utters, whatever may have happened, he knows the air will make the right decisions. Confidently comments that he doesn't merely pretend to have all the answers. Meanwhile, back home. Training Pan. Piccolo tries to add in a little motivation for the young fighter. He taunts that if she only knew what her father had to go through to have the privilege of training with him. But, you know, age before maturity. Nearly tossing her into the sky, the Namekian truly wants her to show that she is worthy. so within reason. She actually manages to land a hit, albeit even if no more than a bop on the nose. Nearby, Sal and Polina of Universe 6. Although since they don't share the same sentiment for Pan as Piccolo, they begin to grow frustrated in using their very limited time for a seemingly useless activity like this. In fact, Polina begins to remark that if he had expected this when he initially decided to come here, Close beaming himself. Our favorite Namekian comments say he thinks, at least in terms of pure physical training, the four of them have come a long way. But rest is also important, so we'd rather not rush things and use this time properly. Sound now doesn't mean to sound derogatory, but is that such a good idea? They might not want to relax with what's ahead of them. This only makes the former bark out with laughter. He warns the rookie not to think they're going to merely be sipping a bowl of fresh water. He still needs to forge his mind and sharpen his knowledge. But knowledge? What does he mean by that? Piccolo's smirk persists. He admits that the two of them have taught him a lot about their race. But the history of their people in this universe is just as exciting. He wants to start by revealing he hasn't told the whole truth. He is not the only Namekian on this planet. Sauna responds that his intuition has been telling him this all along. Looking towards the sky. The other is at the highest point of this planet, beyond the skies, in a sanctuary inaccessible by most common means, lives the god of Earth, who is the person Piccolo respects most in this world. Returning to Universe 14 on Planet Tromel. making their way onto the Destroyer's planet. Dula doesn't waste much time before bellowing out for either Dromel or Zeres. With no response, Salaga offers to take a quick tour of the planet to see if he spots anything. An offer the Venerable Air quickly picks up. Shooting into the air, our still unnamed focal character begins to form a goo-like key. Firing it across the planet. It seems to start Osalaga. As the technique concludes, he shouts out to the air that he didn't even know he was capable of doing that. Though he does imagine that given his position as air, he may wish to remain discreet about all of his abilities. Who, without wasting words, only says that there is no life at all on this planet. Shocked, his opposite asks for how long? How long have the God and Angel been gone? And it seems like for months now. Dula comes streaming down from the air commenting how unbelievable that ability is. Though Slugga takes exception to his relaxed demeanor around the ever important venerable air. But what could he even be air to? Nevertheless, said air waves his arm into the distance. Down there, 
There is a kind of psychic beacon that has been deposited. Maybe that will yield some answers. Spotting it, Dula figures I shouldn't waste any time and go right away. However, the masked warrior demands to go alone. Despite the protest from his companions, he reaffirms that this is not a negotiable topic, ending the conversation. The others resolve to stand guard, just in case. Seemingly with little guesswork, the air opens a portal of some kind at the so-called Psychic Beacon. Entering, he's met with a type of shrine. When? patiently waiting for their superior to return. Slugga very specifically points out that the pillars of the altar have come together to open a kind of magic door. As the pair gaze at it from afar, Dula wonders aloud if he managed to get in. When it vanishes! He knew it! Dula knew it was a trap! They should have never let him go alone! They must go now! They must hasten to find the venerable heir! But Slugga isn't so sure. He can still feel his presence, but it's as if he's in a different dimension now. Sitting down, he wants to focus on his presence. As long as he can still feel him, everything should be okay. But if and when he gives the slightest sign, Dula must destroy the surrounding area without warning. Snickering at this, the wizard is happy to take on such a destructive mission. As a figure moves forth from the shadows, The air readies himself for battle. When a single familiar word is said twice. Kai Kai. Zhao, the Kaioshin of Universe 14. He states that he's been waiting here for the air for more than six months now. He instructs the interloper to follow. Walking and talking, the Kaio assumes that he must be pretty lost on everything that's going on. He would like to apologize for that, though everything up until now has gone the way they thought it would. But they, or rather we, who else is in on this? What's going on? A question the Supreme Kai would rather show the answer to than try to explain. Taking him to a sacred looking room, he explains that the venerable heir is the only one who can come here. This is the hall of the Altar of Angels, where the scepter of the angel of this universe resides when the angel in question is not using it. He prompts the air to take it, grabbing it. It projects an image of Dramel, but isn't he frozen in time currently? The image begins to speak and we finally get a name for this venerable heir, Amaron. The destroyer then mentions how we may have guessed. Neither he or Zeres is here anymore, and Amaron himself has what seems to be amnesia, so he'll refresh his memory. This universe has been completely annihilated in the blink of an eye by the Omni King. This happened while Amaron was proving day by day his ability to become who he claims he would like to be. Not long ago, the universe was restored by a wish-fulfilling dragon from another universe. Afterwards, he himself was approached by a woman who seemed to be the mother of all angels as well as the companion to the Grand Priest. This hierarchical and childish madness of these so-called rulers of all had to cease. They decided to act and go first to the Grand Priest himself. And here they are at the moment. He needs to mention that before Amaron's amnesia, when he was first born on Planet Bread looking for his cherished relics, this will explain everything. Dramel gives him back his memory. We can then see on Planet Bread, the destroyer and angel approached Amaron, who questioned if it was finally time, already seeming to know the both of them. The god remarks that it indeed is, but he did not come here to pick him up. A response that both startled and confused the air. He explained that a student, that despite all of his efforts, he was not yet ready. 
He told Amaron that he was too unpredictable at the moment, so he will stay here with us two clowns. Although Amaron tried to reason with Dramel that with all due respect, he knew perfectly well that he would go against his decision and not let him go without him under any circumstance. The god scolded that this wasn't a decision merely made on the spot and motioned for Zeres, who created the futuristic dwelling we first found our gang in. Although the student tried to fight back, before he knew it, Amaron was hurling towards that mysterious building. That's when he removed his memories, promising he would thank him later. Now that we can safely guess what exactly Amaron is heir to, the destroyer in training comes to terms with all that's been presented to him. Dremel continues. Now that his disciple remembers, if he is hearing this message, it's because they were somehow stopped by the Grand Priest. Zeri sent his scepter to this location just beforehand. As the Kaioshin begins to address him, Amaron stomps out of the room, perhaps predicting what's about to be said. The god explains that after all of this, he himself won't be able to hold his title. For the time being, at the very least, he will ask Amaron only one thing. Finish what he has to do. He will now have the time and status to do it. Because from now on, and by this delegation, he officially becomes the god of destruction of Universe 14. With the introduction of this new god, what impact will he have on the upcoming war? Naturally, he'll want to get revenge for his people. But just how powerful could he possibly be? Before our three characters depart from Dramel's planet, it seems, given the new status associated with Amaron, there's something in particular the gang finds very interesting on this planet. The mythical cube known as the Hexahedron. Gula finds this thing incredible! He had never contemplated this kind of divine vehicle even existing. Focused on their goal, the Destroyer doesn't want to waste any more time. They have work to do. Blasting off, the speed of the cube is unlike anything they've seen before. Dula makes his way to the edge to gaze over as they sear through the cosmos. A little curious, he wonders what the fuel for this thing is anyway. Magic? Or... Maybe the life energy of his passengers? While well, he worries about the specifics, Salaga inquires what exactly their travel plan is supposed to be. And for the moment, Amaron would like to visit the Grand Priest face to face at his palace. But his palace? He actually knows where it is. This is information only angels should know. This apparently causes our newest god to break out in a rash of French, stating, Chaque élément du sous moté vert a impression fonction précise. Which means each element of the multiverse has a specific place and function, and nothing has ever been left simply to chance. Much like anybody who actually speaks French watching this video, Wizard of the Wise isn't so sure he's understanding everything. So spelling it out another way, it's then explained that the three of them cannot move from one universe to another in any order they want. For each itinerary, there are steps to be respected. This means the universes are aligned in a similar, linear way as to countries or planets. He tells how a few years ago, there were only 12 universes. The gods have evoked during the last millennia the concept of twin universes, but this was only a correction of sorts following the disappearance of the other six realms. While this isn't yet made completely clear, Salaga already believes he knows where this is going. When all 18 universes coexisted, they were instead formed into groups of three, so-called triplet universes. There are Universe 14, for example, shared the same galaxies, the same planets, and the same species as Universes 5 and 8. Since they've been resurrected, they are now once again connected to the universes of the Destroyers known as Arak and Liquor. Scratching his chin, Dula realizes this means the place he was born also exists, in identical form, and two other universes. But that isn't exactly the case, as he and Salaga are more exceptions than the rule. Since they came from the Demon Realm, it changes things just a tad. While there are many universes, there are also many different Demon Realms. To be clear, he quickly breaks down the universes and destroyers. These are the triplet universes and their monikers as mentioned before. First, we have universes 1, the Supreme, 12, the Ultimate, and 18, the Prodigious. Next, we have the Benevolent Universe 2, the Just Universe 11, and Universe 17 of Desire. Worth noting that Emron has no memory of the previous five months, so he would still be under the belief that Belmont is the Destroyer and not Top. Then Universe 3, the Witty, 
10 the Macho, and 16 the Impish. Continuing, we have 4 the Malicious, 9 the Sly, and 15 the Cursed. 5 the Balanced, 8 the Worker, 14 the Ambitious. Before finally coming to our own Universe 7, known as the Warrior Universe. 6 the Challengers, and 13 the Champions. Looking at this trio closely, we can only speculate how, if at all, this Balkan Father relates to Beerus and Champa, and how his universe reflects our own. Though it's not made clear if these monikers assigned to each realm have a personal or greater meaning to Amaron, he furthers that the universes are organized in circuits. They are linked so one would have to physically travel through an entire triplet to get to the next triplet. Kind of like the same way for a clock to get to 1 to 4. The hour hand would have to move through 2, 3, and so on first. Getting back to their adventure, they are currently in between universes 8 and 6. Zeres, the angel of universe 14, told him at the end of his message that the Grand Priest Palace is in an isolated place, accessible only by passing through special portals in a specific order. This order changes every 100 years or so, and it was shared with them the current configuration one must follow in order to get to the palace. The first portal resides in Universe 4. The journey will be rather long even aboard this cube. To get there, they must cross a total of five universes. But once they arrive, the portals will become significant shortcuts. The demons suggest they make use of their little trip along the way. They should make stops from time to time to announce the arrival of the new God of Destruction from Universe 14. They can show them that their universe is not so easy to take over. An idea that Amaron doesn't exactly object to. Not long later, the gang find themselves on Planet Rosemary in Universe 4. Home realm to Mouse Guy Destroyer and a bunch of classic warriors such as Bug Guy Piccolo couldn't hear for some reason, Invisible Guy, and of course, Bird Guy. We get a closer look at the locals who appear to be the same race as the bird guy. The trio make a calm arrival under the surface below. Before. Dula uses his magic to broadcast himself to everyone around. He spouts for all ladies and gentlemen to kneel for they have finally made their way onto their world. He presents them with the one and only. The Great! The Almighty! The even more impressive Regular Mighty! Amaron, the one true heir of the Divine Throne! Though... This information is a bit lost on the natives, as everyone just returns to doing their usual day-to-day -day routine. The flustered wizard once again demands that they kneel. Snapping his fingers, we can assume that he uses his magic to force everyone to a knee. Salaga speculates that they must be a primitive species without any form of spoken language. But Amaron doesn't think so, as he spots a couple unique faces among the crowd. One hollers out to beckon what their demands are, and what do they wish to claim from those as insignificant as they? Revealing Bird Guy, or Ganos. Or if I had just waited a page, more specifically not only Ganos, but two Universe 9 warriors as well, Hop and Chapel who also fought in the tournament. Those in the crowd recognize these fighters. Not only that, but they call Ganos the Grand Protector of the Fourth Universe. Zipping in front of him, Dula reveals that they are from the 14th Universe. And before him stands their new leader. The Universe 14! Two years ago at the Tournament of Power, it was explained that there were only 12 universes. And he claims they come from the 14th? Surely this has something to do with the Grand Priest Alert from five months ago. But regardless, it doesn't matter who they are. They are not welcome on Planet Rosemary. This means these folks are already aware of what's to come. Obviously, it's unlikely that the Grand Priest would broadcast such a message to rivaling universes, whether or not these three are conscious at the time. Any which way, here, Dula was aching to toy with them a little more. They looked like so much fun to play with with those little chicken legs of theirs. Slaga interjects to remind the locals that they haven't done anything that would be an offense to them or their new ruler. Yet, since they're feeling generous today, they will be forgiven if they simply kneel before them right now. Though sadly for them, Ganos is quite the stubborn being, likely the most so in this universe. As he and the others take their stance to get ready for battle, Looking on, 
Emron sees there's no way of reasoning with him. And as Ganos takes his true form, or his Super Saiyan bird equivalent, the mage cackles that it's just like attacking a nest and the mother bird coming to protect her babies. Even with Ganos being one of the most powerful warriors this realm has to offer, the evil minions scowl that there is no way a god of destruction can lower himself to this pitiful level. But, a god of destruction? This information sends a chill up the guardian's spine. That's when Hop, one of the Universe 9 warriors, takes notice of this as well. She realizes that Amron's divine key is probably way beyond their comprehension. Do listeners for their dearest error to give them merely two minutes. Just enough time needed to teach these guys properly the errors of their ways. The Destroyer takes minimal interest in this altercation and only turns his back to everyone without saying a word. Ganos regains his focus and assures his comrades not to be discouraged. He knows someone who wouldn't risk letting a god of destruction walk around quietly in this universe. But who could he be referring to? Do they secretly have backup coming? Sure enough, as the least complicated answer is usually the correct one, on planet Quatella, the titular mouse trains with Cognac, his angel. And just as the mortal predicted, the presence of Amron doesn't for a second escape either of these deities. Sensing his key, this is one Quatella doesn't know. Cognac suggests that it's an energy that could belong to a god of destruction, and considering the darkness it emits, this doesn't bode well. This universe's destroyer continues to quickly put together the pieces, and figures if he doesn't recognize the key of a god of destruction, it perhaps originates from a being who comes from a resuscitated universe. He himself wasn't even a destroyer yet when those six realms were erased, but if you were to guess, it's that the two-year warning the Grand Priest gave to the multiverse to prepare has been heard by more universes than intended. Ironically, a theory that is correct by proxy in this case. Cognac states he doesn't recognize this energy either. It is nevertheless lower than Quatella's, but the situation itself remains worrying. He questions him what he would like to do. Screeching out a shrill laugh, what does the angel think? They're talking about his universe, and he forbids anyone to intervene in it, either with or without his authorization. So it's time for him to hit the road. As his mentor complies by tapping his staff. Backup is sure enough on the way. Back on Rosemary, we're met with a scene of vast devastation. A nearby child hides and cries for his mother. While we find Ganos back in his base form, barely able to remain standing. His two allies already defeated, or worse. The two demons take a seat victorious in their endeavor. A shadow that appears to mirror the masked side of Amaron's head cast behind him. who also idles by in this win. Though, he's self-righteous enough to claim that they didn't come here to destroy them, only to warn that the end of everything is soon to begin. However, it's not too late for them to make the right choice. They mustn't choose their own team. They couldn't do anything against Laga and Dula, and that was just a tiny piece of their power. So do they really think it's wise to oppose the likes of himself? Furthermore, even he himself has nothing close to the power that is Lord Dramel. But Dramel, who is that? Amron won't even bother explaining to him. All he needs to know is that he has to think wisely. He holds the fate of his people's lives. And who knows, he may have a chance to meet Dramel if he were to join their side. Ganos only offers a sarcastic smirk to this. He sneers for them to keep acting full of themselves like they are. They have no idea who the warriors of this universe are and what they're capable of. A response Dula didn't want to hear. He uses his magic to seemingly suck the life force from Ganos, giving him the appearance of an old man. That's when Amron senses the presence of Quatella. Given his alarmed demeanor, Cognac was right about the mouse god being stronger. He tells the others it's time to go. Moments later, Ganos groggily comes to at the side of his own destroyer standing over him. And lucky for him, he's back to normal. He has nothing left. A statement the god bats down, essentially telling him that's nonsense. Although it is true he and Cognac arrived a little late. Something the angel asks forgiveness for. Pausing. That's when he remembers Hop and Chapel. What's become of them? But the two of them are also fine, if not hanging their heads in shame. Taking hold of the situation, 
Quatella notices that the three of them seem to be advancing upon their destination. Does Cognac think they can get there before him? Peering in. If they can, it looks like they're in a hexahedron, so it won't be easy. Judging by their trajectory, they're likely heading for a specific portal. Whatever their intentions are, they're not amateurs and have a game plan. In that case, they better hurry up and summon their own cube. When the god realizes they don't even have it, he let his son borrow it. This poor decision aside, he gazes upon the mortals of his realm. Seeing how easily they're beaten, he shudders at the thought they're initially hoping for mortals to be able to help them for the upcoming war. Most of them will never be up to snuff. The angel adds that for those who do have the strength required, the next hurdle will be making sure they don't break down mentally after such high-stake encounters. Quiet. Ganos has nothing to counter this with. At any rate, the destroyer tells Cognac to clean up this planet the best he can. It would be best for it to look less like a world in ruin and give the few remaining inhabitants no memory of what just happened. There's no need to cause unnecessary panic. They will be taking these three with them. This actually shocks his assistant. It's not like Quetella to act in the interest of mortals. Only scoffing at this. The angel taps his staff and states that it will be done if that is his desire. With the Universe 14 fighters. They at last reach the portal they seek in Universe 4. This is the first of three they need to pass through in order to make it to the Grand Priest. Salaga utters that this is what one of those special portals looked like. On the other side lies Universe 10. Only two left. One to get to Universe 6, and the other to get to the Divine Palace. Entering, they find themselves in Universe 10, Planet Argon. The God of Destruction here is Rumshi, the Elephant Destroyer. And a few more warriors from the tournament. On the far right, Rylabu, followed by Abni, and on the far left, Rubal. The other, I believe, is Majikeo of the neighboring Universe 3. As the Sinister Trio continue to make their way from world to world, five months have passed since the events between Kansi and Kaishi. Five months since Goku has been frozen in time. The 12 universes that we know have been training and are still training hard in order to defend the legacy of the previous generations in the best possible way and to defend the destiny of future generations. But it is in Universe 11 that a young warrior sets to upset the seemingly inevitable outcome of the approaching war. A few of the Pride Troopers sear through the sky in one of their jets. Dispo comments how amazing this is. Since the Grand Prix call, a large number of evil individuals have sprung into action and are trying to enforce their own laws, letting their own selfishness consume them. They know that a war is coming and are taking advantage of the tension to gain wealth or territory. Not exactly what I would call amazing, but to each their own. Casserole sees the same, and they're only growing more and more numerous. It's up to the Pride Troopers to stop these individuals before the two years are up. Since five months have passed, they still have over a year and a half to go. In this way, however, they can drastically lower the future alliance of the Grand Priestess. At least in theory, it's not perfectly known how many would join her ranks or remain equally hostile. Jiren has his mind on other things. He asks the pair how long exactly has Gohan been on Planet Grill. On which, he has been there for three days now, and it was only a few hours ago before he gave any sign of life. He asked them to join him, really pressing Jiren himself to be in attendance who condemns how it wasn't very conscious of them to let him go there alone. They know this, but they had no choice. Every member of the Pride Troopers were currently mobilized throughout the universe to stop various wars and opposing organizations. It was Gohan himself who offered to take this task solo. On the planet. Gohan is not only alive, but stands strong and determined. Dispo giggles to just look at him. In just five months, he's unrecognizable. Did Jiren seriously think he would come so far when he first approached him to join? The Grey states that the only reason he agreed to test him out was to repay their debt to Universe 7. Today, he is happy to have him as one of their brothers. Still looking rather intense, Gohan utters that Planet Grill is now cleaned up, as General Casserole asked of him. Who can see this? His leader didn't believe that he would stop an entire army in only three days. But Gohan knows as well as himself that it wasn't necessarily wise to let them all live. While the statement may be true, 
The sand's peaceful. Batman-esque nature doesn't allow him to respond to this fact. The general continues. That army was a wanted organization for several months now. Its members are each responsible for many deaths and incidents. This kind of person does not deserve to be spared. Speaking up for himself, Gohan understands his point of view, and he's sorry he didn't accomplish the mission as he would have liked. But if Earth has taught him anything, it's that our enemies of today can change and become our greatest allies in time. Castro scoffs at this. He warns the newest trooper to be careful not to get lost in his bubblegum, gummy bear world, but thanks him for his service nonetheless. He then activates the device on his head, instructing someone to send members 54 to 71 to Planet Grill. He needs help to manage the situation here, and those already on the planet will not be enough. Jiren approaches our hero. He questions why Gohan summoned him here. Who states that he has been with him for five months now, and his goal is gradually taking shape. This is thanks to Jiren in particular. Four months earlier, we jump back to the night Gohan officially became a pride trooper. After Belmont made the announcement of his survival, Gohan whips his head around to excitedly ask the god how long he's been awake. Castro explains that he returned to his usual self during the rookie's inaugural mission. He wanted to congratulate him in person for making the team. Who takes in the situation? To think, the son of Son Goku would join the Pride Troopers one day. As coy as he is, Gohan admits that if he's just being frank, his original intention wasn't to come all the way out here. He would have just stayed studying if it wasn't for this war business. But it doesn't matter any way to Belmont. Gohan is part of the family now, and he wants to offer him his congratulations. Top adds that since his arrival here, there's been a question that's been on his mind. Why didn't he stay and train with his own people? That Vegeta fellow might even be able to teach him more than them. And, in fact, Gohan started to become interested in their universe ever since the Tournament of Power, especially in their Kaioshin. Which catches Belmont's interest. What does the Saiyan find so interesting about Kai? We already know, but our hero reveals how his potential was awakened by the old Kaioshin of his own universe many years ago. So somehow in a way he hasn't figured out yet, he gets his power today and directly from the Kaioshin, shortly after he sacrificed himself during the Tournament of Power to eliminate Dispo. He asks Shin, the Supreme Kai in his own realm of course, who Kai really was. He can't really explain why, but it's as if the Kaioshin as a whole have been connected to him ever since he came to their world. He feels their energies and potentials. That's when Margarita enters the room. She tells how the world of the Kaioshin is not a place like any other. Few mortals have ever set foot in it. And as far as she can see, Gohan officially wore the Kaioshin outfit, Pataras and all. Because Kibito did this, it officially made him a Kaioshin apprentice. This should give him some of the answers he seeks. Jiren is curious exactly what information Shin told Gohan regarding Kai. Thinking, he said something about the Kaioshins first appearing as golden fruits. These grew through the universe and each one was destined to become a Kaioshin. Kai was a fruit two to three times bigger than the others, which also explains why he has such intense key compared to his counterparts. In any case, Kai is nothing like the other creator gods that any of them know. Is he wrong? This information shocks Belmont. All of this is accurate to his own knowledge, but what does Gohan have in mind? He confirms that Kai indeed possesses powers that his colleagues will never see in their lifetime, pressing him to further explain what he has on his mind. And for some reason, too abstract to even himself, when Gohan utilizes the potential old Kai released, he feels a discomfort in his stomach as if something was only partially unlocked. But if this is the case, why would he never talk about this with the Kaioshin from his own universe? The Saiyan rebuttals that during the period it was awakened, time was quickly working against the heroes of Earth. He had to act fast and the old Kai had already made him much more powerful than he had ever been, or ever thought he could be. Even though he is… quite the odd person. The Angel sums this up. So Gohan is going to ask Kai to complete his awakening, because he feels he's not using his full potential, and he thought that he was the best person to help him achieve this goal. Is that it? While it is, Gohan also knows this probably sounds absurd. However, demanding the Saiyan silence himself, she uses her staff to look within the warrior. She does feel that it is sleeping inside of him. The steps seem to have been taken, but not in the right order. But what does she mean by this? She furthers that when a Kaioshin awakens someone's potential, there are several steps to follow in a precise order. This requires extreme concentration. Not all Kaioshin could awaken potential. Actually, only a handful can. Perhaps the old Kai wasn't rigorous enough. 
And looking back on the ritual, that may carry some truth. Anyway, Gohan's stunted growth in terms of his potential is likely due to the consequences of trusting a perverse Kaioshin, who, moreover, assimilated with an unreliable witch, something that is canon for anyone who may have forgotten. While this frustrates the Saiyan, Margarita elaborates that from what she can see within him, his potential is far from even being half awoken. He seems to have a link to several different sources. A Saiyan father, earthly mother. His potential was first released by a Namekian, and then a second time by a god of creation. The conditions are met for his total awakening to be a success. Offering a subtle bow, Gohan claims he has no doubt about it anymore. He has to reach his true limits to protect everyone, and he needs them all. He thinks to himself about a specific person, that he's beginning to understand what it means to be a vigilante, and he admires him for that. His father, Son Goku, again expressing his gratitude. Dispo warns he doesn't need to be so formal. They were skeptical about him coming here, but he is now a pride trooper, so there is no question where they stand amongst each other. Back in the present, Gohan calls out for Jiren. He wanted to ask for his service. Since his childhood, not a single enemy has ever faced and fought his father the way the Grey did during the Tournament of Power. Even during his fight against Frieza in Android 17, he kept adapting in every aspect to overcome his opponents. There is no doubt that he is truly extraordinary. Gazing at the Saiyan, in addition to his innate abilities and ease of competence in battle, Jiren feels this look in aura. There. So different from his father's, as Gohan requests the Pride Trooper to fight him with all of his power. Waiting for Kai, he will begin to chip away at his limits, starting now. With Gohan quickly becoming the warrior we all believed he could be during the Cell games, and much throughout his life in general, does he actually stand a chance against Jiren the Grey? Will his unique genetics and abilities somehow give him an advantage unavailable to his father? Then we have the case of Amaron and his minions. As they fast track their way to the Divine Palace, what exactly are they planning when face to face with the Grand Priest? Feeling the vibrations through the air. Gohan states that he has to look for his limits. That's the only thing that matters to him in this fight. He'll go all out. Glaring at the duo, Top instructs Margarita to protect this planet and all its inhabitants. This might get very out of control very fast. With a smug smirk, she agrees to do so. The Saiyan descends to face off against Jiren. We can't help but remember back to all the buildup this warrior had during the Tournament of Power. A fighter so arrogant, he refused to engage with the majority of the combatants until necessary. All this would prove to be his undoing. One can make the argument that his confidence isn't without reason. Come on! Damn! I missed him! Galactic Donuts! Taking a page from Gotenks, even borrowing the Galactic Donut did nothing to slow him down. Gohan is left immensely wounded and even coughing up blood. His foe slowly makes his way towards him. Picking him up by the hair, Jiren silently mocks him as there's nothing the Saiyan can do to even contend in this battle. More or less making easy work of the Saiyan, Jiren walks over to him as he's completely stunned. The Grey cocks his arm back as he's unable to do anything about it. Looks on and all. 
he notes how resourceful Gohan truly is. Even with the Kamehameha proving useless, Gohan refuses to admit defeat, once again getting back on his legs. I'm not giving up! We flash back to Jiren's training from when he was a child. Kicked around by his mentor. The old man informs that fighting to get stronger is not enough. He has to hold on to everything he has in order to win fights. But what is he talking about? Jiren reminds that he has nothing left to lose. The only family he has left is him, Master Gishin. So he wants to continue the soul. Smacking him aside yet again, he scolds that the boy has to fight for his values and for those he loves. No matter how many stand in his way, no matter how many there are, because the day he really doesn't have anything, the day he doesn't fight for anyone, is the day the flame that burns inside of him is extinguished. He shouldn't wait until his loved ones are about to die, or even in danger to fight on their behalf. He must already be strong for them when the time comes. It's foolish to wait until the moment you are required to have strength to seek it. With tears welting up, something about the determination in Gohan reminds him of himself. This prompts him to outright ask his opponent why he bothers to keep getting up. He fiercely replies because he still can. Continuing to beat him down, Jiren remarks that the day an opposing god of destruction confronts him with the intention of reducing him and his friends to nothing. Is he really so sure that his little speech of perseverance will save them? His resolve means nothing if he cannot produce the desired outcome. During this, the portal seems to open up a few feet away. A couple of the bad guys from earlier make their way onto the battlefield. They cackle how these fools left them alive. Namely Gohan, if we remember. And if they think they're gonna take it easy on him now that they're free, they've got another thing coming. This bone caster will brace themselves for a fight. Lor Sane, on the other hand, may be in a bit of a situation. Once again, Gohan's kind nature has put himself, by extension everyone else, in the line of danger. Hunched over. He pleads with Jiren that they have to help the other troopers. But he denies this request. He tells Gohan to trust his teammates. In his current condition, he can't do anything anyway. The angel questions Top if he thinks it'd be a good idea to assist his companions. No, he doesn't. Instructing her to look closely, this bone casserole are only pretending to struggle. Which, of course, is quickly noticed by Margarita. This is likely to instill more motivation into their newest member. Back with the spar, Jiren wants to ask him one last time, why does Sun Gohan continue to get up? <laughs> Causing an abundance of reasons to come flooding into his mind. Everyone from his wife and daughter, to his family, to the heroes of Earth and his father. 
particular look comes across Jiren's face. Castro warns them to stop and not to go too far. However, he thinks it's time. Falling lifeless and missing his target. Gohan is congratulated on a job well done regardless. Thinking deeply on the situation at hand, Top comments how they have two years of preparation to stop gods who have been training for millions. This is by far too short of time. Joining Amaron, it looks like they're taking their time with their rampage. Now in Universe 10, Dula and Salaga have already slain Rylubu and Rubal. It's the battle where Yabni and Majikayo shout out that they'll pay for that. What chance do they really stand? And if these three have already made it to Universe 10, that means there's only one more stop before they reach the wounded Grand Priest. 